All right. I'll just uh, say a few words before we start this webinar. I am yes. Dr. Dr. C.P. Das. I am one of those uh, members of this EOPAS, and I wish to welcome uh, our guest faculties, uh, overseas faculties from the United States, Dr. Joel Mata, Dr. Keith Mayo from Europe, uh, Professor Oransky, and we have got uh, uh, Mehlul Acharya from Bristol as the moderator. And fortunately, we have another uh, good uh, international faculty who's with us, uh, not as a faculty, but he's, he's as good as a faculty, Dr. Uh, Carlos Sancinato. We have uh, our Indian faculty, Dr. Ramesh Sen, who is the mentor of this group. And we have got Pradeep uh, uh, Nemade, who's our coordinator, and Pranab Saha as the secretary of this body. I welcome you all. And I think we'll, uh, I'll hand over uh, to Mehlul Acharya for introducing the faculties. Thank you, Mehlul. CP, thank you very much. Um, just a, a few words of thanks before we start. So, dear organizers, um, thank you so much for the invitation to be part uh, of this session and to moderate the session on the extended iliofemoral approach. A special thanks to uh, uh, Dr. CP Das, uh, Dr. Nimadi, Dr. Uh, Shah for organizing it. Um, uh, also uh, a special thanks to our international faculty um, whom I will introduce uh, in a minute. Um, it's really important uh, to think about the teachings of Emile Letanel um, when we think about acetabular fractures. And what Emile Letanel um, said is that perfect reduction gives you the best chance of survival of the native hip joint. And we all deal with acetabular fractures, and there are certain instances where we need access to both the anterior column and the posterior column at the same time. And the extended iliofemoral approach gives us this opportunity. So before we go on and, and hear about this beautiful approach in a bit more detail, I'll just take a few minutes to introduce the faculty. So it gives me great pleasure to um, to welcome and invite uh, Joel Mata, one of the original members of uh, Letanel's Astabula Fracture Club, visited Emil Letanel multiple times. He has been instrumental in the global promotion of Astabula Fracture Surgery and its principles. He is the chairman of the Letanel Course and Workshop. He is the director of the Emil Letanel Institute, founder and chairman of the Anterior Total Hip Arthroplasty Collaborative founder and director of the Hip and Pelvis Institute. He's a recognized national and international lecturer regarding hip and pelvis surgery. He has the largest single surgeon data base regarding operative treatment and results of pelvic and acetabular fractures and is the designer of many orthopedic implants, instruments and prosthesis. We welcome you, Joel Matter. We move on to Keith Mayo studied at the University of Washington, again visited Emile Letanel multiple times, also one of the original members of Letanel's Astabula Fracture Club, is the director of the Hip and Pelvis Center in Washington. He has published numerous articles on pelvic and acetabular fractures, but also on hip preservation surgery and various aspects of trauma. He has worked very closely with the AO Education and AO Foundation and is a member of the AO Pelvic Expert Group. He has been faculty on numerous international pelvic and acetabular courses and has dedicated his career to ensuring that the principles of acetabular surgery are upheld. Welcome, Keith Mayo. Moving on to Michelle Oransky. So Michelle, uh, I met in 2012. He studied in uh, uh, Rome, visited Emil Letanel both in 1985 and 1987. He attended the first Emil Letanel pelvic course in France in 1985. Early in his career, he treated many delayed acetabular fractures, some of which he treated through the extended iliofemoral approach. He's the chief of trauma um, between 1998 and 2007 in San Camilo Hospital, 
Again, he has published numerous articles on pelvic and acetabular fractures, organized the first pelvic course in Italy. He has been faculty on numerous international and national pelvic and acetabular courses. We welcome you, Michelle. So without taking any more of your time, I shall invite Joel Matter to give us his presentation, firstly on the description of the approach, some of the indications with some case examples. Thank you, Dr. Matter. Uh, thank you, Navs. Uh, yeah, the sorry, subject of standard iliofemoral approach has been somewhat controversial, but I think it's still a useful approach that remains. And I think maybe particularly applicable to your situation in India, since you treat a number of old fractures, fractures that are neglected, and there are definite problems in, with the innominate bone, and restoration of the innominate bone is necessary. If you take the line- I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, sir. Uh, you have started the presenter view, so Pardon? we are also seeing the same. Uh, it's better, since you have started the presenter view, uh, we are also seeing the same as you are seeing. It's not, uh, so it's better that you okay. start the full screen. Okay, let me go. Thank you very much. Is this better? Yeah. Much better. Okay, and you can hear the sound okay? Absolutely. Okay. So the extended iliofemoral approach, it actually follows the extensile approach to the hip joint. And so this is an extremely useful approach for acetabular fractures, also for hip arthroplasty or revision arthroplasty, because it's a true extensile approach to the hip. The extensile approach, of course, is defined as following the inner nervous plane, as Henry did. The extended iliofemoral approach comes from Emil Letronel, as we already heard this morning, and he uh, did the approach as a simultaneous approach to both the anterior and the posterior column. And it's the most extensile approach to the innominate bone. Now, I just want to give a brief review that when we're talking about our different fracture types, we continue to use the classification of Letronel, the simple fracture types, anterior wall, anterior column, posterior wall, posterior column, as well as the transverse. And that you see here that they all have a relatively simple fracture line. Though among the simple fracture types, the transverse involve the and does involve actually the anterior plus posterior column and then the associated fracture types posterior column posterior wall transverse posterior wall t-shaped anterior column posterior hemi transverse plus both column the radiologic protocol that is still used is the ap 45 degree oblique fuse 35 degree cauda and cephalad views. I think very often the 45 degree oblique views get lost today, but I still uh, find them to be very useful, even though we have the presence of the CT scan and the 3D CT scan. One of the things that the CT and 3D CT often don't show so well is the congruence between the roof of the acetabulum and the femoral head, we can see best on the oblique views. Also, there are some fracture lines, particularly one fracture line that can be an indication for the extended approach. I'll show you in later radiographic examples that you don't see on the CT because the fracture plane, when fracture planes go parallel to the plane of the CT, you can miss the fracture lines. So the oblique views, uh, still become important, the AP, iliac, and then the obturator also. Now, the goals of surgery from Letternel that I think are still applicable is to anatomically reduce the innominate bone and the acetabulum. So we can't just, in a fracture, for instance, with a both column, we'll get an inferior result just trying to focus on the joint. We need to reduce all aspects of the innominate bone. So our surgical approach has to take that in, into account. Uh, 
and it was really minimizing surgical trauma, minimizing the surgical approach as much as possible was always a principle from the beginning of Letronel, as well as avoiding complications. The operative protocol uh, that we follow and taught is to use a single approach for a fracture. I'll show you a little later that two approaches may be sometimes used, but it's really kind of an exceptional situation. Also, if we use two approaches, it's most often going to be successive approaches. Successive ileolinguinal supine followed by Coker Langenbeck prone or the reverse, beginning with Coker prone and then the ileolinguinal supine. The orthopedic table, uh, the one I use is called the ProFX table, but the orthopedic table is very helpful as well as the specialized reduction for steps plate and screw fixation. So, a common question we used to get at the Paris courses was which approach should be used when the fracture involves the anterior plus posterior column? And any of the three approaches, Coker Langenbeck, ilioinguinal, or extended iliofemoral, may be applicable depending on the classification specific fracture configuration. At this time, I realized the uh, stopa or intrapelvic approach is very popular. The stopa or intrapelvic approach is actually an incomplete ilioinguinal. Uh, the complete ilioinguinal includes uh, that approach plus the ilioinguinal includes the second window of the ilioinguinal, which the intrapelvic approach does not. So the intrapelvic approach is part of an ilioinguinal. And from the beginning of Letronel's teaching, it has been Letronel's protocol to limit the surgical trauma as much as possible by operating through either the Coker Langenbeck or ilioinguinal alone, avoiding two approaches or the extended approach whenever possible. So the subject of today, I'm sure, will be not that the extended is your first choice, but it's, it's something that becomes necessary in a certain number of cases, uh, as we'll be talking about. But the anatomic reduction remains the most important. So that's when we get to uh, surgical exposures, when we can't uh, get an anatomic reduction through a more desirable, less extensive approach. Now, the orthopedic table I don't know about uh, what kind of availability you have for an orthopedic table or what uh, manufacturer in India, but it was used from the beginning by Jude and Letronel. And it's forgotten by many surgeons not used, but it's an important factor <clears throat> in limiting the surgical approach. That is, it's an important factor in maximizing what you can do, for instance, through the Coker Langenbeck alone, or the ilioinguinal approach alone, or if you choose the intrapelvic approach. The orthopedic table is really helping you with the reduction. So if you don't have the help of the orthopedic table, then the uh, reduction becomes more difficult and also the exposures tend to become bigger. Uh, the coker normally performed prone, which I do on the orthopedic table, will give access to the bone, primarily the outside, though you can feel the inside, the area in red. Uh, the, and a number of fractures can be done through coker Langenbeck. The ilioinguinal is done supine, and it's primarily an approach to the inside of the anomic bone. So the coker is a limited area to the outside, the ilioinguinal to the inside, and a number of fractures. I, I did a lot of ilioinguinal approaches. It was the first choice for a both column, first choice for anterior column plus posterior hemitransverse as well as that. But there are a minority of both columns that are very difficult to ilioinguinal. And I'll show you a couple of those cases. Now the extended iliofemoral approach, this gives the most extensile aspect of the anominate bone. So areas you can potentially see are the external aspect of the bone, almost the entire external aspect, and then the internal iliac fossa. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is as far as the anterior column, your access is limited to the area of the pectineal eminence. If you look at the uh, green area, 
on the inside of the innominate bone. So it's limited to here. So there are a few fractures. Actually, were probably two approaches. Successive cochlear-langenbeck and ilioinguinal is a better exposure, a better choice, even than the extended iliofemoral as far as exposure because of the extended exposure with the ilioinguinal along the anterior column. Uh, the extended iliofemoral, and I always get people telling me this picture is upside down, but I put it this way because when I do the extended approach, the patient is lateral and I stand in front of the patient, not behind the patient. So this is the way that uh, I operate with the extended approach. And some of the keys when you make the uh, approach, I'd say, for instance, with the Coker Langenbeck, the biggest mistake is that individuals don't go distal enough along the thigh. However, with the extended iliofemoral, the most common mistake in exposure, I'd say, with the incision is you don't go posterior enough. So the incision must start uh, over the posterior superior spine. It goes completely around the iliac crest and then it'll curve somewhat lateral. So it, it'll go over the tensor fascia lata muscle. And as the, we make the incision, what we, what's probably described as the classic Smith-Peterson interval goes uh, along the interval between the sartorius and the tensor. But with the extended approach, I think it works better if you curve it a little bit lateral and go over the uh, plane of the tensor fascia lata. Now, detachment of the muscle from the iliac crest. Uh, we're thinking already about the closure as you take the muscle off the iliac crest. And so for me to get the best possibility of closure is this area here. You can see a little white area on the muscle. So I try to take a bit of the periosteum off the iliac crest as we come along there. So if you just cut the muscle away from the crest, you're, you're gonna have a difficult time repairing a rather thin fascia lata of muscle. But from the crest, taking a bit of the dense periosteal layer, you can get a, a stout layer here to repair at the end of the procedure. So we've reflected here, we're gonna have the gluteus minimus on the inside, the gluteus medius beyond it. The tensor is gonna be over here. It's gonna be sartorius, it's gonna be rectus femoris. And we will find a very strong fascia or a paneurosis. And it's a, Lepronel referred to it as the aponeurosis with no name. It's not described in anatomy books, but it overlies the anterior portion of the femur. And as you go through the first layer of this, we'll find the lateral femoral circumflex vessels that are clamped and cauterized. There has been some concern about the uh, cutting these vessels and cauterizing it because it can be a collateral to the muscle flap here. I haven't seen any personally any muscle necrosis from doing extended iliofemoral, even with uh, always ligating the vessels. But one thing you can do is that at this point, as the superior gluteal uh, vessels come out of the greater notch, you can use the intraoperative, the Doppler ultrasound measurement to check flow in the superior uh, gluteal artery. But despite that, there is other collateral too from the inferior gluteal artery beyond the lateral femoral circumflex. So the description of necrosis of the musculature, I have not seen this personally. We did do a study where we uh, uh, did a routine Doppler uh, check here. And I know there are documented cases of extended ephemeral where there was interruption of the superior gluteal and still with ligation there was not necrosis. Um, and hopefully Keith uh, will comment on this later too and also Michelle if they've ever seen the problem of the muscle necrosis but if you have a fear you can check the flow at this point. Now we need to, de so we're detaching the abductors from their origin and also from their insertion at the greater trochanter. And the drawing shows cutting the tendons of the 
the gluteus minimus and gluteus medius in their mid substance and tagging them with suture, they'll be repaired later. Later in my series of extended ephemeral approach, I started doing uh, a tenotomy of the minimus. And then I did an osteotomy of the greater troch with the medius origin. But either of them works. And again, it's how you take down the tendon. If you're going to cut the tendon, how you take it down uh, and will make a good repair. But in any event, I think a good method is a tenotomy of the minimus. And then we can do an osteotomy from anterior to posterior, the greater trochanter. Uh, and you'll hear comments from the other speakers on that too. So the final approach to the outer aspect of the innominate bone, you'll see the um, under, underneath the muscle, the superior gluteal nerve and artery. We've gone posterior to the posterior superior spine. Uh, we have the piriformis. We have the obturator internus has been transected. The obturator externus tendon down in this portion of the greater trochanter is actually left intact. It protects the lateral femoral circumflex vessel. The sciatic nerve is also seen back here. And the hip needs to be extended, maybe slightly abducted during this period. As far as taking down the abductors, I was going to mention, this is a very important place. This is the origin of the iliotibial band. It comes from the gluteus medius tubercle. So taking down the iliotibial band with a dense subperiosteal tissue will help to repair, and this is important to repair that. Now, you can also uh, go to the inside of the innominate bone. And this is, can be important for old fractures where you need to go around the bone and you may need to do osteotomies or take out callus. Now, in this case, you, I'm showing the uh, abdominals and iliacus are detached from the inside. Also the sartorius origin I've detached. Also the rectus femoris origin I've detached. And then you can open the hip capsule and get a complete view of the inside of the joint. Now, the picture here is showing an anterior column fracture or it's the anterior column portion of a both column. If I go back a slide, this is a simple both column pattern here, which we typically wouldn't use for this approach. We'd be using ilioinguinal, but if it's an old fracture, we may be using extended, but Oftentimes with this pattern of both column, there's a secondary fracture line at the pectineal eminence or distal to the pectineal eminence. If this fracture line is, is present, you need to leave a soft tissue pedicle on this piece for vascularity. The minimum soft tissue pedicle I've found to be adequate is to use the origin of the rectus femoris. You can still take off part of the sartorius uh, origin, but leave the rectus femoris origin and leave the anterior kip capsule in place. If you do that, then you'll have a soft tissue pedicle to remain, keep this piece vascular. That's in the case with this fracture, the high anterior column plus a pectineal eminence fracture. If the anterior column fracture is here, but the whole anterior column is one piece down to the symphysis, then you can go around both sides of the bone. Now, the closure at the end of the extended iliofemoral, I put multiple sutures, interrupted sutures uh, that are attaching actually the abdominal muscles to the fascia lata, hopefully with this nice dense uh, periosteal rim on here, and then you can get a very good repair. The hips should be held in abduction while you're doing the repair, and then the uh, of course, preceding this repair is going to be the repair of the greater trochanter, these tendons, uh, or repair of the abductor tendons. And then this repair along the iliac crest I do with multiple interrupted sutures. Then I also put a running suture over the interrupted ones uh, from about the area of the medius tubercle to the anterior superior spine. Now, I've seen some surgeons attempt to reattach this uh, abdominal, I mean, excuse me, the gluteal flap with suture anchors in the iliac crest. I don't think this works well at all. You get a much better repair just with sutures between 
this edge of the elevated fasciolata and periosteum and the abdominal muscles along the crest. That's what gives you the uh, best repair. If you're doing an extended for a uh, old transverse or T-shaped, it's also possible to do an osteotomy of the crest to take off a section of the anterior part of the crest and reattach it with screws. But if you have fracture lines reaching the crest like this in a both column fracture or anterior column plus posterior hemitransverse, I would recommend no osteotomies involving the iliac crest. You need all this, all the air of the crest intact for fixation uh, doing that. Now, so the closure I've talked about quite a bit already. It's facilitated by initial meticulous dissection, hold the hip and abduction during the repair, maintain abduction immediately stop. So hold the hip abducted as you take the patient off the table. Uh, we can use the uh, posterior approach total hip abduction pillow initially for at least first 24 hours uh, to allow the tissues to rest. But with the extended approach, I normally use the 700 uh, centigrade uh, HO prophylaxis. Now, cases we're going to consider are sometimes, this is one, the associated transverse plus posterior wall in which there's an extended posterior wall. So if you operate from posterior only, you won't see the reduction in this area. The transtectal T-shaped, very high T-shaped or transtectal transverse is a consideration. Uh, and sometimes both column with a complicated joint fracture or one of the main indications that I think only the extended iliofemoral approach handles well is this both column fracture in which there's a fracture line crossing the sacroiliac joint. And this, this forms a fracture dislocation of the sacroiliac joint. And if this fracture line is not widely displaced, you'll oftentimes only see it on the plane films. You won't see it on the CT because the CT, the plane of the CT cut goes parallel to this fracture line. So, so the patient here would be lateral. I use the orthopedic table. And the first case I'm going to show is uh, a, a both column in which you see this fragment. So this is a greater sciatic notch and it's rotated probably 90 degrees. Here's the notch on the other side, but the AP x-ray view is... Uh, uh, looking parallel to the greater notch, and you see this U-shaped configuration on the AP. Now, the problem with two approaches, some people, they say they use two approaches instead of the extended, but you can't access this through two approaches. The ilioinguinal, you won't be able to reduce and fix this adequately. You need to be on the outside of the anominate bone. The coker langebeck you can't get here either because the superior gluteal nerve goes in this course and will block the proximal access. So to me, this is the true indication for the extended for an acute both column, this uh, fracture. And here you can see on the iliac oblique, again, you can see that piece. This is a rotated piece of the greater static notch. And on the CT scan, you can see the fracture dislocation of the SI joint. So here's the post-operative picture. So the fracture around the joint was not so complex, but in order to follow the principle, I think it's important redu reducing the contour of the anomalous bone, the extended approach was what was indicated for this patient. And so this is the posterior plate, it's on the outside of the anominate bone. So this area is not really accessible through ilioinguinal or coker langenbeck And that was a follow-up of the patient, I believe. Here's another case. This was a uh, both column fracture. If we could argue, you could approach through the ilioinguinal approach. I don't think the uh, intrapelvic approach is good because of the complexity of the anterior column here, but with the complexity of the uh, joint fragments in this case, did uh, an extended iliofemoral approach 
And this is the patient uh, postoperatively, which the reduction is, uh, I believe I graded it anatomic within one millimeter. And then there's a satisfactory follow-up at uh, 18 years post-op, the joint is still functional. Now, uh, probably on the follow-up view, I think it is pretty close to anatomic. It looks like the ileoischial line's in place. The, uh, there may be a slight uh, bowing of the pelvic brim. Here's another use for the extended approach. Of course, this is somebody who's badly operated. And I'm sure you've all seen this where this is a posterior approach. This is, a, I believe it was a T-shaped fracture. So it's a T-shaped operated from posterior. There's an incomplete reduction. And you can see the both anterior and posterior column are not reduced. You see on the iliac oblique on the right, the uh, incongruity. So this was uh, taken down through the extended approach. So at a month after surgery, the extended approach is necessary. And this is an eight-year follow-up of the surgical revision of the malreduction, which shows still a good functioning joint with the extended approach. Uh, stage Ilioingo and Coker. Here's a fracture, a T shape plus posterior wall. And you can see on the obturator oblique, the anterior column is fractured at two levels. There's a separate segment of the anterior wall. So, this is one that I felt was uh, two approaches would be the best for this. Uh, and so, we did a uh, Coker Langenbeck followed by ilioinguinal, but there's a first posterior approach reduction of the posterior column, posterior wall. And then there's a uh, longer plate on the anterior column, as you can see from the pubis to the internal iliac fossa, this plate reduction. And this is a four year follow up with the two approaches. Now, frequency of distribution of approaches that I had. Um, the ilioinguinal, 39%, Coker Langenbeck alone, 44%, extended 16, Coker plus ilioinguinal, 1%. So the two approaches is the smallest. And for both column fractures, it had the highest incidence of extended. They'll also use for transverse posterior wall, the extended is always a yellow. And also for T shaped fractures, surgical approaches distribution over a number of years. The extended you see on here in the blue, never a big proportion, but always there. And the two approaches the smallest, ilioinguinal, Coker Langenbeck. So it's used for a minority of fractures, indicated for a minority of acute fractures. The strongest indication is that both column pattern. Consider it for old, more than three weeks. This may be the only way to preserve the bone. It gives greater command for the reduction. And when the orthopedic table is not available, the indication for the extended and two approaches increases because you don't have quite as good a command of the reduction. Now the extended iliofemoral approach is probably one that uh, it, it's not the easiest to perform. It requires a thorough knowledge of the anatomy, a meticulous dissection, always doing your dissection so that a repair is possible. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to join this. Thank you, Dr. Mata. Thank you very much for your um, uh, very eloquent talk, uh, talking us through the approach and talking us through some examples as well. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, Professor Mota, uh, delighted to hear uh, this ex ex beautiful explanation of this approach. And as you have mentioned, uh, the incision at the idea crest in the avascular white line gives you that tough tissue which you can repair at the end of the operation. As you have mentioned that some people try to do osseous suture, which I did for quite some time. And I found I was bunching up the tissue rather than trying to 
put them together in their proper plane. One thing I would like to ask you that what is the distal extension of your incision in this approach? To what level do you normally go? Normally the uh, tensor fasciolata tells you the distal extent. So as you go distally along the thigh, and I should have included that, when you get to the end of the tensor muscle, that's the distal extent of the incision. Right, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, most of these people are bulkier people. And when you have this large flap, which your assistant is retracting, putting the liver into the greater sciatic notch, they sometimes cause maceration of the muscles. And I find giving a little religious incision, both towards the posterior aspect and towards the distal aspect, helps me to keep the uh, tension off the flap. And uh, I do not know, I mean, when I talk, I would request you if you can, I uh, see I'm, a, I'm absolutely delighted to listen to you. I learned just like that. I was wondering, we do not have heterotopic ossification in our country. Uh, from my experience, we don't have much. I do not know whether it is because we are putting little bigger incision and the tissues are relaxed and there is no maceration or necrosis of the muscles and or because we are washing it frequently with uh, hydrogen peroxide and saline to remove the dust from the operating wood. I don't know, but we don't have much heterotopic ossification. Number two, I wanted to ask you, if, uh, what is your preference between doing an osteotomy of the greater trochanter and the tenotomy? What you, today, what would you prefer? Well, I'm, that's a very good observation. You just said that you don't have much heterotopic ossification. So if you don't, then I wouldn't do the radiation therapy. And I think what you said are very important factors that uh, tension on the muscle, trauma to the muscle, and probably, and you brought up a really good point too that Letternell used to talk about is keeping the flap moist too. So what you're doing is frequent irrigation and you're not putting tension on the tissue. And if you can uh, perform surgery like this without the heterotopic ossification, it's important. Now it also depends a little bit on the age of the fracture. And uh, the older fractures, tend to have less heterotopic ossification. So I think uh, when you operate more acutely, there's gonna be kind of an inflammatory phase going on and you can stir it up with that. But uh, you can ex explain to me how that, um, your situation in India, but I think you're doing a lot of delayed reconstruction and then the um, <clears throat> chance of the HO is less. There's one, oh yeah, that, the handling the abductor tendons, at, at this time I prefer to do the osteotomy. I will uh, uh, do a tenotomy of the gluteus minimus, and then I will get a good view of the medius tendon, and then I'll do an osteotomy of the greater trochanter. <clears throat> but we certainly have to follow the principles of preserving vascularity to the proximal femur. So the uh, osteotomized greater trochanter can't be too big. Uh, the cut has to come out just kind of uh, almost splitting the posterior edge of the greater tr uh, trochanter. And then I fix it, <clears throat> I think usually at the end just with two uh, 3.5 millimeter screws. But uh, probably the uh, uh, one thing I've learned over the years as far as regaining abductor function and the patient not limping afterwards is the integrity of the iliotibial band origin from the iliac crest. So you need to probably very important, maybe people worry about the trochanteric area, but it may be more important with the extended approach is the repair along the iliac crest. And then even if you allow the patient to rest in bed for some time until there is some chance for uh, maybe some initial soft tissue healing and swelling going down before they're ambulated. So can I ask you, uh, in your publication in 2005 in JBJS, uh, on the safety and efficacy of uh, external aliofemoral approach, you have mentioned that there is no difference in the incidence of heterotopic ossification between cases operated acutely and operated late. Is it uh, that you, you say something different now? Uh, 
<laughs> Maybe I should go back and read my own data. Maybe the data is going to speak uh, most strongly. But I think, uh, yeah, it, it's an impression I had that probably with the, uh, what you call late cases, but very late cases. I mean, I, I think there was some hypothesis at one time that the delayed cases have the higher incidence of HO. And if anything, I think it's a reverse. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, the extended iliofemoral cases, I don't have so many. So sometimes it's hard to get a statistical significance, you know. But if you look at statistics, you find some surprising things. Mm -hmm. Also like, uh, if you really look at the cases, it's very hard to uh, correlate the incidence of, uh, necrosis of the femoral head with prolonged dislocation of the femoral head. And I'm talking about acetabular fractures with an unreduced posterior dislocation. If you have a pure dislocation of the hip without a fracture, there, there's probably a higher incidence of necrosis because the vessels are under a higher stretch. They're more displacement. But when you're looking at old cases, and let's say you have old transverse plus posterior wall fracture. It comes in and it's six weeks later and the hip's been dislocated. You can't assume that the head is gonna be necrotic. Probably the head is still gonna be vascular and being and reconstructing the acetabulum through the extended approach to the head will still be okay. Yeah, I agree. So, I think it might, might partly be due to the second hit as well. And when that second hit occurs, um, and you know the, the surgical insult and so they've already had their first hit with the fracture and then the potential second hit with the with the exposure and surgery and it may well be that it's a timing effect as to when that second hit occurs I agree as far as the heterotopic bone you're meaning as absolutely as far as the heterotopic yeah. bone yeah okay thank you so on your indications of uh, this approach you have uh, mentioned about uh, fracture extending to the sacroiliac joint. And of course, there are other indications like complex uh, as ABC fractures. You showed us one case. It's a low ABC fracture, which is just a supraastabular fracture uh, associated both column fracture. You showed us that case. I, for me, I find that's one of the main indications, which probably not described or mentioned in the book. I find when the establishment is blown out in the supraastabular area, with a low ABC type of fracture, I find most convenient to do with the extended ilofemoral approach, like your LC 3.2 fracture types. I find it more challenging and much easier to do with this approach. I don't know. I mean, this is not mentioned in the book. When I present, you please correct me if I'm wrong in that, uh, this thing. I think the example I showed was very similar to what you're talking about that it didn't involve a large portion of the iliac wing, but it was very complex in the area of the joint and the uh, extended approach allowed some intraarticular visualization reduction. And you saw the, uh, at least in this patient, there was a good long-term follow-up. I think it was uh, 18 year follow-up with satisfactory hip function. So one last question, a high posterior column involvement where you risk the superior gluteal artery, would you do uh, your uh, extended ilofemoral approach or KL approach? Whichever approach you do, if there is a rupture of the vessel, which approach would you think would give access to get the vessel or catch the vessel? I mean, do you think you you repair the, with a cocker langenbeck with a flip tro or trochanteric osteotomy and try to fix that, or you would go for an extended ilofemoral approach? <laughs> Yeah, your question, uh, I'm not sure I heard it correct, but you said it was a high posterior column? In the ABC, when the posterior column fracture exits at the point okay. where you- You're talking about a both column with a very yes, high sir. posterior column. Yes, yeah, yeah, there is, uh, yeah, I mean, essentially the highest posterior column fracture is the one that extends so proximal. It involves the inferior portion of the sacroiliac joint. So it can come into that category and sometimes you would use it. Uh, the other situation is that um, a, a few times uh, the posterior column goes very high, even if it doesn't uh, involve the 
um, inferior sacroiliac joint, it can get stuck in front of the sacrum. And so it, it goes uh, medial to the SI joint and the upper point of the posterior column is stuck in front of the sacrum. And this can be an indication also for the extended approach because this posterior column incarcerated in front of the sacrum in a both column, I, I don't think it's, it's very difficult to deal with through ilioinguinal or through um, uh, the intrapelvic approach. That's a good question, dude. We're moving on to uh, Keith. I think we better Thank keep you. this thing Thank going. You. And, and, and Keith, uh, maybe you could make a couple comments about indications, the things we were just talking about, the very high posterior column in front of the sacrum, the uh, uh, relatively low iliac fracture, but complex joint. Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. I mean, I I can just go ahead with the talk. I think the only thing I don't talk about is uh, directly is the the high posterior column component of a both column. Um, and I guess my experience with those is that a lot of those are relatively axially oriented posterior columns. And even though they're high, relatively cranial on their exit point, as long as you don't think the vessels are directly involved, those are the ones where the reduction and fixation of the posterior column from the anterior approach is actually, I think, in many ways, much easier just because of the orientation in the uh, sagittal plane. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll come back to the other things later on. Great, so we're moving on um, to the second talk. Um, it's my pleasure to invite Keith Mayo, who's gonna um, share with us some case examples, but also um, his reason for using the extended iliofemoral approach. Keith, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Mez. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us this morning, or actually evening for you, uh, early morning for me. Um, okay. Sorry, it's easier to do this first. All right, uh, there's gonna be a lot of overlap um, and you probably get uh, subtle differences in, in, in techniques uh, amongst the three talks here, probably just because of the difference in clinical experience. So um, when we talk about the, the, the extended ephemeral, it's important to realize that, that early in the series with Fletcher now that they did do some Smith-Peterson approaches and the inadequacies of that approach, which <clears throat> was relatively limited lateral exposure of the innominate bone, essentially led to the uh, further development of the extended iliofemoral. And I'm just gonna reiterate the fact that um, this conference and most of what we do in a pelvis and acetabular surgery would not have ever transpired if it hadn't been for this man, which is a, a difficult thing to, to realize in a, in a point in history, as Joel's mentioned, where the um, endopelvic approaches have become predominant. And if we look at the number of fellowship trained North American, North American surgeons with, who are still capable of doing uh, Cochlear-Langenbeck's nilioinguinals in a way that maximizes the exposure the way Joel has already outlined is actually quite depressingly small. Um, but so I think it's really important for all the reasons we've already touched on to keep his legacy alive. So this is your final access to the direct access to the lateral aspect of the innominate bone. And then you can actually get to the ischium for osteotomies laid and digital access to the quadrilateral surface <clears throat> with the caveats that Joel already mentioned about potentially devascularizing the anterior column in particular, if you're not careful. Um, and these are the problems I think with perpetuating the use of this approach. And that is 
we generally reserve it only for the more difficult injury patterns. I think it's technically the most demanding approach. And because of these combined factors that has the highest overall complication rate. And it's a truism in orthopedic surgery and in all surgeries that in general, the things that you do frequently, you do better. And so if you were doing these approaches infrequently in difficult patterns and it's technically demanding that you're setting yourself up for um, an avoidance complex in which you do everything you can to avoid doing it. And that again, perpetuates the cycle. So the fewer you do, the more reluctant you are to do them. And I think that's just an innate human tendency. So we've already talked briefly about the um, indications and those are the transtectal transverse family of fractures, the T-shaped and transverse posterior wall in which this is a uh, variably oriented fracture through the primary weight bearing surface of the acetabulum. So ideally this would be a perfect reduction. And we, I think everybody realizes that the problems with a single posterior cochalangenbeck or single anterior variant ilioinguinal or other is that you have great control of the column that you're looking at, but you'd have poor control of the opposite portion of the ischiopubic fragment for the transverse family, or if it's a T-shaped or associated both column, you can generally see it and you can see a portion of that reduction, but you can't see the part on the opposite side. And that has always been a dilemma. And we can, we can handicap that race to some extent with a variety of different techniques and certainly the traction, sustained traction through a table or other method is very useful if you have the ability to use ligament ataxis for indirect reduction of the opposite column but that's been one of the dilemmas. And then we go to the both column fractures, which Joel's already shown you as far as fractures involving an inaccessible portion of the sacroiliac joint. Um, and then segmental posterior column fractures, which are uh, involved in a tercularary portion of the posterior column in the greater sciatic notch typically. Uh, severely comminuted fractures or fractures in which the typical pattern shows a uh, zone of marginal impaction. And CP's already talked to you about this, this sort of B variant as Emil broke both columns into A and B variants in which the A's extended to the iliac crest. And then as CP already mentioned, the lower that exit point of the anterior column, I think it's more difficult to control the um, anterior column moiety. And then another thing that I think I've learned the hard way, and I'll show you a case, is if you start with a very small intact iliac segment, you have a very high likelihood of uh, developing a reduction in which is essentially a surgical secondary congruence, which as the long-term data has shown, um, does not hold up as well as a perfect reduction. Indications that further indications are, I think the Joel's already mentioned, extended posterior walls in which the entire retroastabular surface is taken out. So you have no reduction clues. And especially that family in which you have an extended posterior wall associated with the posterior column. And then a lot of patterns in which your surgery is delayed more than three weeks. And we've talked about that and Michelle's gonna show us more cases later on. So the transtectal family is important, I think, for relatively straightforward reasons in that the ideal reduction would be essentially chondrocyte to chondrocyte. And the further we get away from that, um, the more likelihood that we're gonna have early joint wear and the fact that there may be a very subtle rotational or minimal displacement in the side opposite of our primary approach led uh, Emil to in general, and especially in the younger patients, which is where these patterns predominate, um, advise an extended approach so that you had not only direct control of both columns, but you could also open the joint and assess your reduction uh, directly, which is not the case for both the Coker-Langenbeck 
in the ilioinguinal where you're assuming that if you have an extra articular reduction, it's just perfect, then your articular reduction will also be perfect. So then if we looked at the patterns that involved the sacroiliac joint, these uh, patterns on your left, um, which takes off a variable portion of the SI joint with or without a portion of the sciatic notch, and then the sort of B type, uh, both columns that we all already discussed previously, as far as being a low exit of the anterior column. So you're looking at a very small segment you're dealing with directly. So case in point, this is when I, I probably pushed the ilioinguinal farther than I should have uh, for many years. This was a, a, a 38 year old MVC, relatively typical both column until we look at this uh, early 3D reconstruction. And you can see how small the intact posterior portion of the anominate bone is. And then there are some additional complicating factors, including a double segmental anterior column. And I thought at this point in history that I could do virtually anything through an ilioinguinal. And this is the lateral part of that with the associated posterior wall. And this is a five-year follow-up. And this is a classic example of surgical secondary congruence. Now, if you look at his right hip or his left hip rather, there is a subtle asymmetry. It's a lateral uh, wider joint than medial. And that's certainly an anatomic variant, but this is even more disparate than that. And you can also tell by the profile of the anominate bone versus this. This is almost a perfectly centered AP. And we have a winking obturator foramen that this is clearly surgical secondary congruence. And so this hip is not going to be durable long term. I don't know what his long term was. This is only at five years. And here he looks congruent in the other two views, but this is clearly not going to be the same durable uh, outcome. And I think it all dates back to the fact that when you start with a very small intact segment, your chance of having surgical secondary congruence, at least in my experience, is 100%. So what about contraindications? Um, I think the biggest problem is somebody has taken a massive blunt trauma to the gluteal muscle mass. And we don't have a very good way of assessing that. I mean, we tried to assess this with MR in cases where I've been concerned, but I don't really know how to assess the metabolic status of uh, muscle very well with MR. Joel's already talked about the issues of uh, potential superior gluteal artery injury and what the anastomoses, which are in place from the, from the lateral circumflex, as well as the inferior gluteal. Um, uh, Claude Martinbeau did look up a series of known, uh, essentially embolization cases. There were nine cases in that series in which an extended iliofemoral had been performed after superior gluteal artery embolization and there were no cases of flat macrosis. Um, it doesn't mean it makes you happy to be operating in that scenario. It does probably make you more likely if you can um, get the exposure you need without occasionally not sacrificing the lateral circumflex vessels, which are a primary blood supply, if not to the flap, at least to the tensor. Um, but you run into the dilemma then of sacrificing your exposure, uh, uh, in which case you're not going to have the optimum visualization. The upper age limit is, uh, is unclear. I think that relates to rehabilitation more than anything else. I think in Joel's series, um, there were uh, of extended iliofemorals. I don't remember an age um, problem with relationship to regaining abductor function, but uh, certainly I, I'm, I'm less anxious to do this over age 40. The problems we all know about are associated with head injuries. And then uh, if there have been either a previous surgical incisions, such as uh, starting points for anti-grade femoral nails. And then there's always the question of what's the upper limit in terms of BMI as far as getting to uh, this surgical approach. I don't have good answers for any of those, um, but they have to factor into the equation. Certainly somebody with 
who comes in with a G, uh, GCI of seven or eight is going to make me reluctant, um, irrespective of their potential for recovery, to do an extended iliofemoral. Um, we'll talk briefly about logistics because uh, um, the fracture table certainly has clear advantages, but I think most of the people in this audience do not have access to a fracture table of any type that's really a, a useful adjunct. And so I've used, um, I've been in, in institutions that both had fracture tables and didn't. And so we'll just go through this scenario where we have the fracture table, which allows you to laterally uh, distract the joint and then pull distally. And so what can you do to give you some of those advantages without that? And so the, the things that we've done is basically uh, replaced that perineal post with a soft support, which acts as a fulcrum. And this is a distal and lateral traction, which is difficult to maintain, which is a major advantage uh, that you don't get, uh, which you don't have the perineal post. And then you can pull that direction and then you can push and use the post as a fulcrum, which will deliver the head laterally to some extent you don't like to do that for extended periods, but it certainly can be done. And in some cases, you can also jerry-rig a skeletal distal femoral traction as well. For traction and distraction through the joint, then you have the option for using the uh, uh, femoral distractor, usually from the posterior part of the innominate bone to the proximal femur. And this is what it looks like intraoperatively. Um, and uh, then we'll go briefly over potential modifications, things that you've seen in the literature, uh, flaps and osteotomies, Joel's already talked to them. So this is your standard approach with the modification that Joel talked about, going through the tensor sheath rather than the tensor sartorius interval. The first one was the so-called uh, uh, Dallas or T-shaped intervention. I think this is a bad idea. In general, I was always taught and firmly believed that elevating big uh, subcutaneous flaps, in the set, especially in the setting of trauma, is poorly advised. So I would just take this off the table. I think you can deviate this portion of the incision somewhat more lateral, so it doesn't go over across this mid portion of the, the skin crease, and that does tend to de decrease some of the, the uh, skin problems we've seen at this point, but I would never use this incision per se. And then if we look at osteotomies, this has already been touched on. Um, the uh, Reinert or, or Dallas approach recommended routine use of either anterior or you know, uh, medius pillar bone blocks, which Joel's already pointed out if your life is already difficult because you have a fracture that extends to the crest, the last thing you want to do is make it more difficult by adding your own fracture to that mix. <clears throat> so I've only done this uh, three times um, where I, I did convert to the trochanteric osteotomy. I would caution you, though, that if you're not used to doing a trochanteric osteotomy from an anterior to posterior position, there are significant hazards if you end up um, deviating too far medially in the posterior portion. And so the key part is, uh, that Joel already mentioned is taking down the minimus tendon that gives you direct access. And then you have a digital access underneath the abductor so you can palpate the posterior tip of the trochanter. And usually the first few times you do this, you end up being relatively conservative and you wish you'd made a thicker segment that's probably better than knocking off the ascending branches of the medial femoral circumflex. And as usual, I usually pre-drill this before I do the osteotomy. So at the end of the case, when I'm tired and I'm trying to get this back on, I already have it lined up to put the screws in. So there's modifications. Um, this is sort of the uh, view with a femoral distractor in place. It's a bit out of sequence, but you can get certainly enough distraction through the joint that you can see in this case, which was a T-shaped fracture that you can actually see directly into the joint, um, which is much easier with a distractor, I think, than 
by having somebody try to hold on to a shant screw in the proximal femur long enough for you to do everything you need to do. Reduction sequence, I'm, I'm not gonna belabor. This is, should be relatively straightforward. In general, we build from intact anatomy back toward the joint, um, uh, which is a bit different than other articular fractures like tibial plateaus or distal femurs where we usually distract, reconstruct the joint, and then put that back onto the diaphysis or the metaphysis. So it is a, a, a different sequence. And it's critical that in this situation that this be a stable segment. So if this is an unstable segment because it's relatively small and your sacroiliac joint complex is not working very well, then you run, then there's another complicating factor. But normally you would attach the segment involving the sciatic buttress in the lower part of the joint back to intact dominant bone and then rebuild to the anterior column and then lastly, the posterior column. The sequence uh, in this relatively simplified fracture pattern is, just sort of replicates that with the exception that in this situation, you don't see the secondary uh, fracture of the anterior column, which typically is here or is in the low anterior horn of the acetabulum. This is probably the most re um, neglected reduction and frequently the most difficult, and that is the intercalary segment. Um, and this is critical because an get an anatomic uh, reduction of the anterior column. And so the Weber clamp, I think, is typically the case. Frequently, you'll need not only one, but two, because this fracture may be oblique and require a second application of a clamp here. And that determines then whether you're going to use a lag or a position screw. If it's an oblique fracture and you lag it, then you're going to create a malreduction. So frequently, you, instead of having one lag screw, in the friendliest case, you'll have one or two, three, five, very peripheral, very tangential uh, position screws. And then once you've got that, then you would go to the reduction of the anterior column, which in cases like this, where it extends to the crest, is frequently the easiest reduction. So, and you can use a point of reduction clamp, you can use a ferro buff, you can use a small or a large Jungbluth clamp, and then you'll have a variety of different position places to put these uh, anterior to posterior screws, which if you put them in the full corridor can be all the way back to the posterior superior spine. But in general, those are oriented relative to the specific orientation of this fracture pattern. And they again can either be uh, lag screws or position screws based on their relative position relative to the fracture. And once you have that done, you have to decide whether or not you need something else to help, which would be a uh, basically a neutralization plate along the mid substance of the innominate bone. And that may be necessary. And then this is examples for reduction of the posterior column, which I think can be very challenging, particularly in people that have a large muscle flap. And I always start with a shant screw in the ischium. And my favorite clamp is still always the Weber clamp, which can be modified in terms of the geometry, usually through two drill holes. If that doesn't work, you can go to a Farabuff clamp, again, with rotational control through a shant screw. You can go to the large or small Farabuff clamp. Uh, and you can use uh, any number of other clamps, including these quadrangular clamps, which theoretically are the best because they traverse um, from lateral superior to medial, uh, essentially in a, in a point of application, which more approximates a, a compression or a, a lag screw itself. And then once that's reduced and you would go to this posterior column lag screw, which is really frequently difficult to put in because you're very close with a drill bit to the medius pillar. And so you have to decide whether you're gonna be anterior or posterior to the medius pillar in order to stay most tangential to the quad, to the uh, innominate face. Um, so I'm just gonna go through additional cases that sort of show some of these, uh, you've seen Joel's cases, Hopefully across the spectrum, you'll see different indications. 
So this is a, an 18 year old uh, male with this associated both your co both column pattern, which had these additional complicating components, which is um, a segmental posterior column, which I think is virtually, and this is an early 3D CT in which the smoothing algorithm has already taken out the fact that this is actually a complete fracture. So you can see it better here. And I think that my ability to manage that from an anterior approach is, is um, stretched to its absolute limits and probably beyond. So this to me then is generally an indication for an extended approach where I can look at the entire um, expanse of the posterior column. And in this case, I had the additional need to fix this relatively small atypical associated posterior wall component of the both column. So many reasons in addition to that, not to mention the fact that also we're broaching the, the limits of the size of this fragment. And this is just the initial post-op, or actually I think this is a two-year follow-up with the kind of construct which you can typically get. This is an atypical associated both column uh, in which the, uh, the, you're not dealing with a, with a pure posterior column moiety, but you have an, an ischiopubic segment as a sigmal segment, but it involves the inferior portion of the sacroiliac joint. And these are volume rendered uh, images in which we had relatively good software. And so even though we had plain films, I had these as well. And you can see the fact that this involves an inex inaccessible portion of the SI joint. So unless this reduction is perfect, you have no hope of getting this reduction perfect or this one. So um, I thought briefly about doing this from an anterior approach. Um, and this is what it looked like just with the standard 3D reconstructions. In addition to the fact he had, this was in about 10 days, this was with a fair amount of road rash, but I'm less concerned about this than I am massive blunt trauma. So I admit that this is pushing it a bit. Um, and that's what his soft tissue envelope looked like. Um, but in fact, we actually had no wound problems. Um, we thought there's been a, 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 fair, <clears throat> a fair amount of discussion about how to do these approaches. Um, this is one of the three cases where I did not only a trochanteric osteotomy, but I was able, because this was a single large segment, to take the medius pillar bone block. And maybe it's just because I'm slow surgically, um, but I've had always had some anxiety about reattaching the abductors uh, to the innominate bone at the end of the case. It's usually fairly easy posteriorly where there's a thick fascial sleeve. Uh, you, you have the distal extension of the lumbodorsal fascia but where I really want it to be reattached is at the level of the medius pillar um, where the iliotibial tract originates. And, um, and so I've cheated always on taking as much of a fascial periosteal sleeve as possible, including taking some of the uh, oblique insertion as part of that cuff. And so I have gone early to not only just um, using a bone block where I had the opportunity, but also uh, reattaching that thickened or expanded sleeve back through drill holes in the crest where I didn't think I had adequate a soft tissue sleeve opposing it. Some of that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more of that sleeve you take with the abductors, the left you, less you have left at the end to attach to. And then you have the problems of um, a relatively insubstantial musculo uh, insertional junction between the external oblique um, and your um, abductor fascial sleeve. So this is what it looks like with the bone block, two screws. Um, and this is, I think, a really great way to take it when you're given this sort of gift presentation and you can put this, um, yeah, this is a trapezoidal shaped bone block, which keys in nicely and uh, then very easily makes the, uh, the rest of the reattachment relatively straightforward. 
This is an atypical case, and this is a, an older case that says uh, this is a 28-year-old female. It is a difficult to read, but we can see in this view, um, this was uh, more of an inlet, but here's her um, obturator oblique, and she doesn't have any weight-bearing surface available. There's a very large posterior wall, and if we look at her CT, then we see that the entire posterior portion of, of the wall extending to and including the retroacetabular surface and then an undisplaced posterior column component uh, made it would have made it impossible for me to safely get cranial enough to get this even through what some people would propose, which would be a digastric osteotomy, surgical subluxation, dislocation approach. I couldn't do that, this fracture through that safely. So this was an extended approach. And you can see how distal I had to get in order to anchor the distal portion of the quadrilateral surface in this position. Okay, so just in summary, uh, a plea to um, recognize the importance of this approach, even though I think we've all gotten probably better at handicapping the race as far as additional techniques to deal with the problems with these transtectal transverse family of fractures in the problematic both columns. Um, I think if you're doing a large number of acute cases, and probably even more, if you're doing delayed cases, you're going to need this uh, approach. And, um, and you have to fight the tendency to come up with a reason to push your limits on the alternatives um, with the understanding that still the reduction is the, the key component. And, um, and with that, I'm basically going to close and turn it back over to Mez. Keith, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that was a fantastic uh, description and, and talk about um, the approach once again, but also about reduction uh, maneuvers um, in specific cases or specific troublesome cases. So, um, Keith, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions um, specifically to uh, Dr. Mayo? Yes, sir. Uh, one question I have put it uh, in front, and uh, that is in blowout kind of severely comminuted fractures of the acetabulum, especially which involves a low anterior column, would you prefer to do the EIF along with an AIP approach? Have you had any case where you have had to do it combined? Um, I guess I, I didn't need a better definition of what a blowout fracture is. I'm not that doesn't, I can't place that anatomically. Uh, fractures where the combination is extending beyond the iliopubic eminence, uh, the iliopecanal eminence, and it is also extending into low anterior column. Well, I think I'd have to, I would, I'd have to see the case. I have never done, um, I mean, I don't, there's no way for me to do uh, an endopelvic approach sideline. And so I, I would sort of take that off the table. <clears throat> I'm not sure. I mean, I, 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 you have access even without uh, taking the um, internal portion of the exposure with some judicious expansion. You can certainly get to the iliopectineal eminence through a standard iliofemoral approach. Um, and if there is more medial comminution, I really don't care about it because it's extra articular or it's so low in the anterior column, it's not going to impact outcome. So I guess I I'm not understanding exactly what fracture pattern we're talking about. <clears throat> and uh, so the second question was regarding the technique of uh, abductor tenotomy and repair. Uh, Dr. Mata or Dr. Mayo, either of you. Well, I think we've, um, I mean, the abductor, you know, we're talking about off, so there's two different, one is taking down the origin from the crest. And particularly, from the trochanter. Okay, from the trochanter. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Joel's already shown the position of the, the minimus is very anterior on the trochanter. And so that is actually hooding the area that you need to see before, before you can do an osteotomy. So that has to be, I don't think there's a safe way, at least I can't do a safe trochanteric osteotomy from anterior to posterior with that intact. And so you take down the minimus, tag that for a repair, and then make sure that you have adequate access to the posterior part of the trochanter. I usually cut this with my finger on the posterior tip of the trochanter, which is you're sliding it underneath the abductor muscle sleeve. And I've already pre-drilled it for reattachment at that point. And then, um, and Joel already pointed out, it's the same technique and that the safe way to do it is to probably cheat a little bit superficial so that you're leaving a little tiny bit of the medius tendon still attached to the intact femur. And then you can release that after the trochanter is mobilized. But this is not a digastric osteotomy. You've also, you've already had to take down the um, distal portion of the trochanter uh, soft tissue attachment at the level of the vastus tubercle. So the vast lateralis is detached. So this is a true trochanteric fragment uh, the way it was originally done. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. Um, so we'll move on, move on um, to the next talk. Uh, and it gives me again, great pleasure to invite uh, Michelle Aransky um, to give his talk uh, and his experience using the extended, extended iliofemoral approach. Michelle, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you very much to you all. And I'm happy to be with you. Okay, maybe I have to take off this. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay, okay, and so I will continue with the crap. Okay, when I start in, in Italy uh, many years ago, most of the cases were not treated and were left in conventional treatment. Nowadays, it's different because everybody wants to operate as a tabular surgery. We have thousands of, or many, many pelvic surgeons. But anyway, that was the, the problem we had. So the learning objectives of this talk will be to understand when to apply the extended iliofemoral approach, even if my friends already did that to understand the logistics and the major complications that I had, I will show some of them. Uh, I took this slide from Keith. This is an approach that is applied in the most difficult injury pattern. It's the technically most demanding, so you must be a trained surgeon who knows what is going to do to know the, the anatomy, otherwise uh, you will add a second problem to the patient. Disadvantages, we, you have, we, we hope you, 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 we can do the routine radiation, but I had problems in my hospitals, in the university. The radiologist told to me, my time is only for tumoral patients. I will not irradiate your patients. Then I had an epoch where, where I could irradiate the patient, but now, it's forbidden in Italy to irradiate patients below the age of 60. So we cannot irradiate any more the patients in Italy. It's technically demanding because you have a huge operating field. And, uh, you have to control the whole thing uh, to know exactly which are the steps you are going to apply. And then the patient must know that he has to do a prolonged rehabilitation. The advantages, we already hear that, simultaneous visualization of both anterior and posterior column, even if, if it is a little bit restricted on the anterior aspect. And the reduction step, as kids show, are straightforward and more or less always the same problem. If the, your patient had a traumatic brain injury or had been in coma, uh, he will develop heterotopic ossification. If he is a chronic alcoholist, in my experience, he also will get heterotopic ossifications. Uh, and 
already keep talk about local wounds and obesity. As I told you, irradiation is not anymore allowed in Italy below age of 60. The indications, we go back again on the fracture types, transtectal and transverse T-shaped, not all, but the high ones and some post column fractures, those who has SI joint involvement or segmental posterior column comminution. Uh, small intact ELEC segment, and I will dedicate mostly to show you cases after the three weeks. Okay, uh, you already talked of when to apply the, in the extended iliofemoral in both column fractures, when the posterior column is very high, uh, wide displacement at the rim, uh, segmental fractures of the posterior column, associated SA joint disrupt disruption, and some very rare posterior wall fractures. So you have some examples here, but um, for example, you can see here this patient who had a huge posterior wall fragment displaced and also an anterior wall uh, segmental fragment. Uh, this is difficult to reduce by the extended because you have the rectus femoris here, but the combination makes uh, me to choice in this case, the extended video femoral. Then you have here the type two both column fracture with the fragment who goes very anteriorly, also with a small fracture on the sciatic notch. So you cannot properly reduce that by the inguinal because you don't know if your fragment is uh, perfectly reduced. And you must be, take care of these fragments because they must be remain attached to the joint capsule. Sometimes you have also associated fractures of this air in this area on the sagittal plane. And this is uh, very difficult uh, to reduce and you must take care not to devascularize them. You have here another posterior wall and segmental fracture of the posterior column. Logistic, the fracture table, fracture table is Another surgeon, I like it very much because it gives you a position. You have no, to know how to handle. You can make traction, rotate the limb, abduct, uh, push it laterally. Uh, it helps very much, uh, but it's difficult to position it, the patient, but it's very, very useful. You can see here the original one of the table and you this is the lateral post who extracts you the hip from the inside of the joint and then you can make an axial traction and also rotate but you, you must be careful you you should not exaggerate in any of the tractions you do so you can have to feel on um, these three uh, the soft tissues because too much tension is not good for the reduction. When you use the external, the distractor, this is a slide from Keith. I want just to point out that sometimes the, the pin, the shunt screw must go on into the sacrum because if your fragment, if your iliac wing or intact segment of the iliac wing is small, you cannot put the pin on the, on the anterior part of the fracture. So, because you have to move the, the segment. So this is another complication if you don't use the fracture table. Uh, Joel spoke of that, the anterior collateral branch of the lateral circumflex, you have to ligate it. And after below of this, you will find the no-name fascia. Uh, when you open this fascia, you will reach the rectus femoris, the direct tendon, but you can see the reflex tendon, and uh, the, the inferior limit of this tendon tells you where is the, where starts, where starts the joint. This is the sartorius and the spine. Okay, the gluteus minor, the, the gluteus minor, minimus, 
there is a trick. It's always above the femoral neck. What's the problem? The problem is that the hip is medialized and then it's not under tension and you have difficulty to recognize it and it's not white like this. So one of the tricks is to lateralize the hip and put into external rotation and try to find the tendon. It's just, it makes it more easier. And once, you once you have calf, you go above the femoral neck and dissect with the knife from the capsule. Uh, this is just for anatomy. You can see here the reflex tendon, which uh, we have sometimes to transect to have uh, access to the fracture line. Here you can see the vastus lateralis, the sartorius, and the minimus tendon, which has been tagged. And then you reflect this tendon and arrive to the gluteus medius, and here the piriformis. This is the, the point where you can just or cut or do the trochanterotomy. It's not a digastric trochanterotomy, it's an osteotomy, which detaches also the vastus lateralis. And then you're, once you have done that, you're flat. It's okay, we don't do that anymore. As I said, we do the trochanterotomy too. And here you have the sciatic nerve, the piriformis, and these are the superior gluteal nerve. So all, you, all your flap will be hinted into, will stretch a little bit these structures. But if you cut, if you arrive very far posteriorly, it will not be so much stretched. This is, but you go, you leave that behind and you can go with instruments inside the vertebral sciatic notch. Uh, I want to show, this case, uh, who I took the picture from Emilia Cornell, she was a lady of 36 years old of age. The, she had this transfer plus posterior wall fracture at six months. So look, this is not a perfect reduction. This is a head below the roof. But to do this, you have, you have to be really a master surgeon. I don't know if I would be able to do a kind of surgery like that. Maybe I do not recognize here some wing fractures, but anyway, this is a very nice surgery. Uh, this is one of my cases. This is a variant of the transverse. You have a iliac wing tract, an intermediate fragment, and also a posterior wall fragment that you can see here. This is the femoral head as I joined. Uh, this, I think, one of my first extent. Oh, I, I lost the case. I'm sorry. Okay, but I have the result of this case at 20 years. I'm sorry, I lost the x ray. And this is another fracture, a boss colon fracture at five months. The patient, age 26, was left in the bed. He was not very conscious. He had uh, problems with a chronic trauma. Uh, you can appreciate here a roof segmentation that we documented with the CT scan, but the head is still not damaged because he did not walk. So this is a good indication. Well, a difficult indication, but it, it can be an indication. Oh, oh I, I think I did a mess with my cases. I'm sorry, may I? What happened? Okay, I'm sorry, I'll take the pictures just a second. Okay. I'm sorry. So I did the extended and you can see here a roof osteotomy. So I went supracetabular like a Chiari or a periacetabular kind of periacetabular. I, I went above the roof segment fragments 
and also from inside the, of the pelvis. It's one of the few times I have done that and completed the osteotomy uh, from the inside in the posterior column and in the roof. You can see here the tendons target on the trochanter. And then I pull it laterally the head and I managed to reduce also the posterior column from the front. And this is the result of 15 years. So it's not perfect. He has a osteoarthritis, he has an osteophyte, and I did a, a ablation of remodeling of the hip, of the head, and took away this osteophyte. Uh, so he gained a a little bit of mobility. He had no pain at this point and I have not seen anymore the patient. So this is another case where you have a both column fracture with a intermediate fracture, uh, joint fracture here. This cannot be managed by ileoinguinal or by sequential, it's very difficult. You can see here the intermediate fragment and also a segmental fracture of the anterior wall. She was a lady, this is a, not an anatomical reduction, but this is a secondary congruency. I could not reach the portion medial to the iliopectineal eminence. Then you have the result of two years, and this is the result of 16 years. It's, it's not a normal hip, but it's uh, adequate. I mean, the patient, went to me because another problem, she still has no problem on this joint. I'm sorry, this is the case of the 20 years that I showed you before, okay. Uh, this patient had a transfer structure at more than three weeks. Uh, I did the osteotomy of the spine. You can see the result of nine years. He was a friend of mine after the surgery. He died after 20 years after the, the surgery. He still maintained his hip without any problem. This lady, age 25, she had lateral traction, um, axial traction combined. I think also an external fixation, but I'm not quite sure of that. She had a T-type fracture the head is still in a good position, in good shape, not damaged. And these are the uh, intraoperative views. You can see the transfer tract of the fracture and the vertical tract of the T, uh, the, the vertical branch of the T. This is posterior and here we are anterior and this is the femoral head. So this is the, the intraticular reduction, the intraticular view of the reduction is not perfect here, but some problems of reduction I have. Then you can see the Jungblus clamp and the, the, post, the recon plate and the posterior aspect and the two screws that go to the anterior column. And this is the result. Okay, this is not an anatomical reduction of the anterior column but it's much better than before. This is the screw on the posterior column. And then I, the patient didn't came back to me, but a friend of mine sent me this picture after 25 years. Okay, it's a very bad arthritis. Maybe she was well for 10 years, but she kept her hip for 25 years. And then she had a total hip replacement. Both columns, one month, young patient. Uh, you, he was nailed on the femur and tibia. This is a type two, again, post column fracture. You can see here the, the 3D from the inner aspect. This is the roof. And this was the result. It was, I was not quite happy because it's not really anatomical. Uh, and then the patient came back to me after 12 years because these screws bother him. So it's a secondary congruency. The hip is 
not normal here, but he doesn't still complain of this uh, result that he still has in his head. Uh, again, a transverse fracture with posterior wall. Uh, the head is not damaged, 25 days, young patient, male. You can see here the 3D is the intra-pelvic aspect of the transverse, the posterior wall, the posterior colon, the posterior aspect of the transverse, and here the posterior wall. You see the, the posterior wall extends very far anteriorly until the spine. This is indication for extended neurofemoral. And he also had a intraarticular fragment. So I did the surgery by the extended and the patient disappeared. And then he, okay, this is the result, post-operative result. Uh, I am a little bit, the problem I should, I, I have the participants over my, over my imaging. So I don't know how to take, okay, okay. Okay, I minimize it here. Then you have here, you can see here the screw on the anterior column and the screws that goes to fix the posterior column as Keith showed to you before. And then the patient came back for a disc herniation to me after 18 years. He says, my hip is normal. You see, this is, there is not a great joint line also on the other side, but this is adiosification around the tendons, but he has no problem at the moment. Lady of age 22, she jumped from the, from the balcony and she was left in this situation almost three months. Uh, the head is good. And why the head is good? The head, you have, uh, this is a T fracture where the vertical stem is posterior and then the posterior wall. Uh, I don't want, I did not took the black x-rays. I was happy with this because she already had so many x-rays. Uh, and then you see the head, why the head is good? The explanation is because the head is working or is around the, the cartilage in all the views. So the head was not damaged. You can see the callus here. She was irradiated and I used also a Benacaba filter. I will show you why. And this is the 3D. So the head was completely against cartilage. You can see here the intraarticular transfer tract. And as Letournel uh, wrote, uh, after bones, you cannot see the fracture lines outside the bone. But if you go inside the joint, you can appreciate much better the fracture lines because they are with granulating tissue or they are not uh, healed, the cartilage. The, there is a lack of cartilage in that area. You can see here the transverse fracture inside the joint. And this was the post-op result. She had this, the iliac crest osteotomy and the trochanteric osteotomy. And this is the result, which is very good. Uh, I did, I performed in this case, a contralateral uh, percutaneous pubic osteotomies because I was afraid that my transverse structure will not go back because of the retraction. This is the first step, this uh, percutaneous osteotomies of the boobies and of, of the issue. The patient also had this. So she was left three months in this situation with external fixation. So that's why I put on her a, a Benacaba filter because I had to do also this kind of surgery. And you can see here the patient. The patient doesn't come back to me because I treated her very roughly to move the knees and everything. So anyway, because I want, she, she was depressed, but this is a result of three years and I know she's working, she's an architect. 
complication. Again, this guy was left three months in this situation, more or less, young patient. He has uh, the cubitus in this area because of the traction fray. So I had to take, to make an excision of the, the cubitus in this area, wait a week, uh, and then I performed this extended iliofemoral, also the osteotomies on the other side, percutaneous osteotomies. And I was happy and the patient disappears and comes back after one year. Okay, these are the, the results on the other views. Uh, the patient comes back after one year and say, uh oh, so this, I think it's my fault. In some, somewhere there was a screws inside the joint. I, I could not recognize in any of these views. I, I am not sure, but what I want to say to you, you must do always a, a post-operative CT scan to be sure that there are no screws inside the joint. Uh, and, but he got this total hit. And this case is a very old CT scan. You can see a fragment here in front of the neck also, and also on the back. So there was a comminution of the posterior wall uh, and it doesn't look anatomic, but I think I was too optimistic. I, I did not frame it. I did not support the posterior wall with plates or screws. Maybe I should use uh, another plate in this area. And what happened, he, he dislocated after one month. I was, I did maintain the capsule attached to the fragments, but this was the end result. So he, he had a total hit after that. Uh, okay, this is a, a imperfect reduction. I had this transfer to posterior wall, intra-articular incarcerated fragments, and you can see here the reduction. There is a defect um, on the anterior column, and that's why, because I know that from a post-operative CT scan, I over-reduced the posterior wall and the posterior column, and I push the head in the front. So I have no place to reduce my uh, anterior aspect of the, of the column. So I could not de rotate. And these screws tried to bring my anterior portion of the fracture to the ilium, but the problem was on the back. I did an over reduction on the posterior column. And this is an anecdotic case. This lady had an accident in Rome crossing the street and she went to a hospital and somebody told to her, look, there is a famous surgeon in Paris. You should go to visit him. And she went to Paris, but she did not meet Emile Tourneur. She met another, um, another guy, I don't know who. And this was the result of this extended ilofemoral surgery. So if we are going to do this surgery, we must be trained and we must to fight to obtain always the anatomic reduction to avoid improvisations. So as Joel said, and he told you already, this approach is justified in a limited number of cases in young adults with trained surgeons. You must uh, handle the such tissues as best as you can and always try to obtain anatomic reduction. If you don't have anatomic reduction, your patient will uh, not function and will not be able to rehabilitate adequately. Thank you very much. Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your overview on um, some difficult and very delayed cases um, and how you'd um, tackle them. Um, do we have any questions? I think Dr. Okay, Pranav so, has put it on the yeah, chat. Yeah, that's right. So there's a couple of couple of questions um, on the on the yeah. group chat. Um, firstly, um, to to all three of the international faculty. Um, how often do you perform a, a capsulotomy 
Um, and how often do you perform a, a subluxation dislocation of the hip? Is it routine or is it just for specific cases? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, it, it's for me, the, the, you, you would never do a capsulotomy when there was a posterior oh, wall component. Um, and so in, in all, in a number of those cases, I mean, we just reviewed our series of both columns and we had about a 20, I think it was 22% incidence of posterior wall components. Most of those are, um, the more typical cranial extent with a spike that exits on the anterior portion of the medius pillar. And because the labrum is intact, um, you can, especially if you do them early, you can still address those for the lingual. <clears throat> the, I think for me, the capsulotomy I would use for transtectal, transverse, or T-shaped fractures, where I want to look directly into the joint and assess the reduction because there's no biological cost in those cases. Certainly you'd never take down a capsular pedicle to a wall fragment to do that. <clears throat> the problem becomes in some cases you would have to, in which there's an atypical posterior wall. Um, and I've only seen this, I can only remember this happening once um, with this, with a both column and a posterior wall in which it was a more typical posterior wall in which the in inferior displacement is greater than um, proximal. And in fact, the labrum had been avulsed. So it was almost like two different mechanisms. And um, then you have the problem of what do you do at the cranial limit in order to see inside the joint. And at that time, I just, I sectioned the labrum transversely and then extended the capsulotomy. But in general, I think for this approach, you would never do a capsulotomy associated with the wall itself. And um, so the most useful part of that is for the transverse moieties, typically the transfer, transsexual transverse and T-shaped. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to the next talk. Um, and uh, it's our co-organizer, um, CP, Dr. CP Das, um, who's going to speak to us about the risks and the rewards of this extended iliofemoral approach. Dr. Das, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mitch. I'll be speaking both for and against this approach. Before I speak, I would express my gratitude for the masters who will be listening to my talk. And if you find any mistake, please do correct me because I don't have much experience in this. Most importantly, uh, while I am giving my certain opinion on this approach, this is a purely personal opinion. And if you find that my opinion is inappropriate, please do uh, let me know. And I would be very happy if you can correct me. So I'll go into my presentation. Yes, on slide share. Sure. Okay. So risk and rewards of extended idiofemoral approach. We are having Dr. Carlos Sancineto with us. He's silent, but I think I would ask him, uh, he can answer this. This is 2015, uh, soon after the Litonel course in Lucerne. I, I was watching this uh, in Litonel course, Professor Mata showed us the cadaveric dissection on extended iliofemoral approach. And a week later, Viewmedi uh, View, webcast uh, was on this current approaches in fracture stabulum, and there was no mention of this approach. So I asked all these faculty, why don't you talk on this approach, this extended elephant approach? And I was told this approach is not in vogue. And I mailed to Dr. Mata asking his opinion on this. And he was kind enough to say that old cases and the minority of the acute cases require this approach. So, you know, the scenario worldwide is a serious decline in its use. If you see this, uh, 
table, you will find in 1994, Keith Mayo had about 16% of his 163 cases where he used this approach. But in 1996, again, Dr. Mata presented his one third, one fourth of his cases had extended ilofenol approach. But subsequently, you see the number has dropped. And we want to find out why. Why it is not being used or is used less. So our knowledge so far, I was reading this book and it said the complication rates remain higher than other approaches. Chapter written by Dr. David Helfeld. And I'm surprised that this is despite the high rates of anatomical reduction and good outcomes. So whether we are treating this fact, this approach at par with other approaches, because the, uh, the type of fractures that used to be treated by this approach are different from the type of cases that we are using in other approaches. We are using simpler fractures with kale or the anterior approaches. We are using complicated fractures with this approach. So definitely there is going to be some change in the rate of complication. So this needs to be taken into consideration. And a statement which says that the complication rates are higher in this approach makes the other surgeons reluctant to use it. So we'll have to see what are the risk and benefit of this approach. So what are the complications? All the speakers have discussed about this heterotrophic classification. And apparently, I would, I would withdraw my statement on that severity of the ex, uh, heterotrophic ossification in acutely done cases seems to be higher, contrary to what was published in 2005. Next comes sciatic nerve irritation. We get sciatic nerve issues with the cocker langenbeck approach. Lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. We get this issue with the iliovenal approach. Superior gluteal neurovascular problem. I think we had a good discussion by Dr. Keith Mayo, Dr. Mata, and Dr. Mata mentioned that he doesn't have any experience of massive abductor necrosis. I'm aware of the publication by Ritonel Mata, Mast, and Matimeo, 400 cases, and they had no such report. So whether this risk is real or not, that we'll have to assess. And if there is a risk of this neurovascular injury, that must be a tiny risk. So we should not be putting that as a reason for not doing this approach. I remember uh, following a report from China, Mark really started doing pre-op angio in all the cases that he was doing extended ilofemoral approach. After doing on 40 consecutive cases, he stopped doing it because he did not find any pre-op injury to this vessel. Currently, the evidence which says that abductor necrosis can happen is on animal study or cadaveric studies. And there is a study on canine by Tabor. He said this abductor necrosis is not significant disability. As Dr. Mata said, there are collaterals. Despite having ligation of the lateral circumflex femoral vessel, they can still withstand and the abductor won't go into a massive necrosis. There may be ischemia, but there may not be massive necrosis. So this complication did not be highlighted as a reason for not using this approach. Femoral nerve and vessel injury. We know that our limit in this approach anteriorly is up to the iliopectinal eminence. If you go beyond that without dissecting the iliopectinal fascia, you are likely to get this injury. So that's not recommended. So why unnecessarily do that procedure to have this complication? Own margin necrosis, of course, this is a very invasive approach and you can expect own margin necrosis if you are not very careful uh, with this approach. Abductor weakness, Dr. Mata has already mentioned that this, if you don't do a proper repair of the tension fascia lata at the iliac crest, you can expect an abductor weakness. So this approach requires very meticulous surgical exercise. Prolonged recovery, no doubt there is prolonged recovery. Because you are dealing with a very difficult fracture, your recovery would be prolonged. So that cannot be, again, another excuse for not using this approach. It has also been said that the future THR can be troublesome. Now, Dr. Joel Mata has published 2005 that there would be no problem if you do this uh, or do THR despite having this approach. One of my friends in 
aims in bhubneshwar he has done one case where i had done an extend dilutional approach and it required a feature he did a much problem so these are the reasons i'll just summarize that all the complications which are listed here do not sound to be big complications excepting heterotopic ossification which i am not sure we don't get why we don't get but other complications are like any other surgical exercise so i just quote this paper from dr mata from 2005 in jbjs where he mentioned that there is uncertainty about the most sur effective surgical approach to treat the complex fractures of acetabulum and in the same paper he said this extended ilofemoral approach is a versatile and effective approach for treatment of complex patterns of fracture and interestingly he also said that since its inception there has been little information available to the value of this approach there has been a trend away from extended ilofemoral approach because of the concerns over the increased morbidity such as infection stiffness abductor weakness and heterotopic ossification this is a very interesting paper from france 2018 it was it was a, it was an article which was asking should this enlarged ilofemoral approach be abandoned and they found that the impact of its invasiveness has not been confirmed and no long term results are known so that means somebody after having made a search on the pubmed did not find enough evidence to say that this invasive approach is bad and what they found from their uh, study they concluded that this allows anatomical reduction of difficult fractures it has got very good long term results without excessive morbidity so to infer from these two papers what we know that not enough information is available on this approach and not enough study has been done to find out what is the impact of invasiveness of this approach and what is the long term outcome however from the paper from france they found they got very good exposure it allowed control over all the fracture fragments they had good long term results and no excessive morbidity so this is what i would like to put before i start my own presentation my experience with this approach is for last 20 years i happened to do once in 3 months one of these cases mostly on delayed presentations also i do in properly indicated not so delayed cases what we would see in my presentation that how i am doing with severe abc fractures in fresh injuries late presentations and another point when i find that we cannot reconstruct the acetabulum completely we try to reconstruct the dome part you know that when we see this indication for acetabular fracture surgery the mm -hmm. mata's angle or the upper 10 mm of the acetabular dome if that is okay you don't treat them surgically you treat them conservatively so if we cannot get a global reconstruction of the acetabulum we try to reconstruct the dome and i'll show you what the results are and if during this approach if you get a mild reduction you know, like dr keith may showed incongruity there was a tiny incongruity i was i found it difficult to find out where was the incongruity but there was incongruity he found out from the shape of the ileum and from the opening between the head of the femur and the acetabulum there was lack of parallelism that is why he said it's incongruous that tiny incongruity if you find during an intraop situation by your c arm you can revise the surgery if you are through this extended ilofemoral approach without any difficulty and regarding the superior gluteal vessel injury wound necrosis what was my experience i would also say and i have a personal perception about how to avoid this heterotopic ossification and deep infection so this is a lady young lady 22 years old she fell from a height of 30 feet she had some blunt trauma in the chest arrives on the 11th day post injury this is what is her x ray this is a typical case which dr mata showed and i think all the speakers dr mayo and dr oransky they showed this is a low abc fracture type 2 where there is complete supra acetabular comminution you see this in the jude view this is a ct scan this is a short segment 
articular fracture. So how do you reduce this and how do you fix it, stabilize it by indirect reduction? Probably the best thing I think is to do a direct reduction. This is what it is. This is a segmental fracture in the anterior part, it's an intra-articular loose body, and this posterior wall is extending superiorly and is comminuted. So this is a low ABC fracture. If you go according to the AO classification, which reflects the severity of the injury, it's a C2.3 injury. So the challenges are how to approach the posterior column, anterior column, anterior wall area, posterior superior wall, remove the loose body, stabilize the posterior column, anterior column, and do an accurate reduction under vision of the short, thin, supraestabular articular block. And then you give a stable fixation. How do you fix such a tiny fragment stably so that you can mobilize the patient? Of course, you may have to graft this fracture to prevent from further displacement and to help it to heal early. So the choice of approach where dual approach, ileal of cockle Langenbeck with complete trochanteric osteotomy or extended ileal approach. And I had to add parents to because there was a anterior column injury which required fixation right up to the pubic tubercle. And I chose the latter. So this is the classical uh, picture from Littonel's uh, book. Extra, uh, this is, you go posterior, you go anterior, and then you go superior with this approach. This is a picture from the intra picture. I'll show you this is the, this, this is the part which requires fixation in a very delicate manner because it's a tiny piece of bone and it can only take one screw or one bolt from a plate. So to fix that, I had to use two plates in the front and I included the posterior, this is the, this is the tiny part of the bone and I included the posterior fixation with this one also to add for the stability. When you are doing this, you are not disturbing the blood supply to this fragment because they are attached to the capsule and to the rectus. And finally, the void was filled with graft. This reduction was done under vision. This is on day zero. You can see this fracture has been very well stabilized. And at the end of three months, at the end of one year, and this is the void in the trochanter from where the graft was taken. One has to be very careful because it can lead to instability in your fixation. That's why I added a tension band wiring to the fixation to give further stability. And this is the lady at the end of one year. Of course, she came from a far off place. So she, she apparently she was okay by the six months time. She has no weakness of the abductor, no weakness of the extensors. Her range of movement in the hip joints are normal. There is no gluteal lurch or tendon bug gait uh, when she stands on one leg. And you see when she's walking, she was in my office and uh, the floor was mopped, so she was walking carefully. You see, she has no pain. She walks extremely comfortably. You look at the picture on the right side. This is the type of injury, and this is the recovery. So I think most of it goes, the credit goes to the approach. If you do the approach correctly, you certainly can expect a good outcome. We'll go to the second case. It's a 26-year-old male, high-velocity injury, and isolated injury arrives on third day. If you see, uh, this is there's a floating dome and anterior column exiting at the crest and the fracture is extended to the sacroiliac joint which Dr. Mata was telling about it. This is a CT scan and you can see the dome is completely shattered. This is a very complex type of fracture, low ABC again. And this fracture again is extending to the sacroiliac joint. So, how do you address this? You, when you, I prefer to do through external approach and graph the dome after doing articular reduction. Through this, after fixing from the periphery, through this posterior flap of the uh, extended posterior wall fracture, I opened up and did reduction of the articular segments under vision and then grafted it. And this is what it looked like, I think. Dr. Keith may or may not be happy because there is some amount of incongruity on the outside at the outer lip of the uh, acetabulum. And this is how 
he heal, uh, this is the post of today view. This is at the end of one year. The incongruity is still there. The patient is pretty much asymptomatic. This is what is the Jude view. This is the approach. Another gentleman who is again 26, arrives on 16th day, isolated injury. This is the injury he has got, say P view. This is Jude view. You can see that there is a big floating triangular piece of bone, articular bone, and this is the bone. And you see on the CT scan, this is on the 3D CT, the superior gluteal vessel coming out at this place is at risk. I decided to go through extended elevation approach. And this is the fracture you see, which uh, is you are seeing uh, being caved in in the supra supraostabular area. So this, this fragment had to be retrieved to its normal place. We use a last femoral distractor and then reduce the fracture. This was after reduction. This is post-op X-ray. At the end of 10 years, this gentleman is very much asymptomatic. At the end of 16 years, he recently broke his tibia and he came to me. This is at the end of 16 years and he has absolutely no disability. This was the original picture, the final picture. Coming to some delayed presentations, this is a 26 years old lady. Manual labor run over by a tractor, had a rupture bladder which was repaired, re explored, and re repaired. This is, this is our x ray, and this is Jude view, CT scan. This is how it looks like in the 3D. And this is her, you know, the front and the back. So, like Dr. Mayo's patient, where there was a deep graze in the buttock, gluteal area. And he still went in and didn't have any problem. We decided to go in through the external elephant approach. Isolated the area. On my left picture, the head of the femur is seen through the wound. And on the right, is after the reduction, it looks pretty good. And we only focused on the roof reconstruction. That's what I was telling. We're trying to create Mata's roof heart and get the roof okay. So the dome, if it covers the head adequately, I feel the hip can function reasonably well and can remain stable. And if only if the head of the femur remains congruous with the acetabulum. I ignored the anterior wall and column beyond the iliopecnia elements because I could not go through this approach. Number two, there was a surgery in the bladder. This is at the end of three weeks. This is a magnified view of the same X-ray and we are trying to create the roof arc of Mata for this patient to be asymptomatic for some time. At the end of 14 years, this is the picture. And you can see when we enlarge this picture, the roof is still okay. And there's good joint space in the roof and the patient is asymptomatic. Though she has some restriction of the movement. This is her range of movement. She has pain-free mobile stable hip joint. Cross leg sitting is awkward. Congruity at the Board bearing dome is okay. And if you want to do a future THR, you can do. She has already managed for 14 years, but she has no symptoms at the moment. Another case, an engineer who's 26, had an RTA, comes after 23 days. This is what it looks like, ABC. And again, we plan to reconstruct the roof. And that is the 3D CT scan. Decided to operate through extended dilutional approach. This was the intra picture. This is what we achieved. We got the roof right. And at the end of 11 years, he has got a congruous hip joint and he has reasonable function. And we put him on the stairs. I made him walk a few times. This is, this is after a few times, he was still going up and down and he didn't have any symptoms. He, though he still limps a little bit, uh, after being uh, uh, going up and down for a few times, but he didn't have much problem. This is the function he has. Coming to complications, wound margin necrosis, I'll show you. It's a lady of 47 years old, had polytrauma about six weeks ago. Uh, 
fracture dislocation was treated with proximal tibial pin traction. She has good secondary congruence, but the moment the traction was taken off, hip telescope, the hip was unstable. It was failing to unite. This is how she came to me. And this is after fixation. And on the day two, she had changes of uh, wound margins in the front of the thigh. And on the day four, this is what looked like. We excised the wound and it did not heal. So we had to re-excise and put it back on the 17th day. And finally, the wound healed and this is what is our functional status. So any surgery can have complication. Even, I mean, wound necrosis is nothing that we should stop doing you from this approach. So this is at the end of uh, four years. This is how she walks. This is a two years old uh, video. And uh, she is much better than this now. Superior gluteal neurovascular injury. I had the misfortune of having a case. It's a transtectal transverse fracture, six weeks plus injury. And I was trying to dissect this vessel out of his place and trying to get it reduced over the fracture. And I ruptured the vessel. And I don't know if the video may not play. I'll show you separately. This was a transtectal transverse fracture with a hill shaft region in the head. And this is a CT scan. I don't know whether you are able to see the video. I'm sorry if you are not able to see. Not able to see, but you okay. can go into I'll the show you later video. On. Yeah. I, I'll show you later on. So this is this is what the post of extra looks like. Uh, Dr. Mayo said chondrocyte to chondrocyte suture. It's true. You should have a com com complete anatomical reduction in this kind of transtectal transverse fracture. At the end of seven years, the gentleman is like that. At the end of 10 years, recently he visited me. He has gluteal necrosis uh, or gluteal lurch. This video was seen by Dr. Mark Raleigh. He said, I have tied the supraglutial nerve along with the vessel. That's why he's having this gluteal lurch. He thinks the vessel has nothing to do with the necrosis. So this is how he was walking. But he has no pain. He does not use any walking aid. And he has a gluteal lurch. So if you see this uh, picture, you see there's a spike of bone which is jutting out at the greater sciatic notch. And it's very close to your superior gluteal vessel. So this kind of spike can injure this vessel if you are not careful. I feel superior gluteal vessel is much safer when you go by the external elevational approach rather than by other approach. If you suppose approach this particular fracture with the KL approach, you may not know where is the spike and you may not know how the spike is going to injure the vessel. So the reward with this approach is it allows reliably anatomical articular reduction of complex fractures. Direct reduction, you can do under vision. If you want, if you feel there is incongruity, you can revise the fixation. And you have control over all the fracture fragments. Dr. Mayo said, transtectal transverse fracture, you should see the articular reduction. This is a transtectal transverse fracture. And in the capsulotomy, you see this is the articular reduction before you start your fixation. This is the case which I showed. If you want to revive, I'll just show you a 54 years old gentleman, 23 days old injury, debridement and peripheral anatomical reduction. And this is what the incongruous hip joint. And you find it that probably you have removed the bones during the rebrima and you have caused the lack of parallelism in the x-rays, which is incongruity. And this is how it happened. You remove that bone during the debrima and you squeeze peripherally and the fracture opened up centrally. The acetabulum became incongruous. So we had to revise it. We have to take out the fixation and then open up peripherally till we got the hip congruous. Now the hip is congruous. Once you open up adequately till the hip is congruous, you do the fixation. This is how it is fixed. So there is a peripheral space or gap in the ileum, but the hip is congruous. If you see this, this is at, at the end of 11 years. He is doing well. 
this approach allows you to do this kind of adjustments how to prevent some complications the main concern is heterotopic ossification i don't know why we don't get this much i am not sure whether we have done enough study or we, we don't know why i don't see that so this is the original picture of litonel this that's why i asked dr mata how far distally he would go in his incision this is the incision which he recommended i think it helps you to relax the soft tissue it helps you to prevent pressure from the retractors which are put in the greater sciatic notch onto the big muscle flap and it prevents probably the uh, uh, nidus for having the heterotopic ossification this is how the wound looks like but you need to wash it time and again this is a clean wound at that when you go and close it's a large wound but it's a clean wound and we don't get uh, heterotopic ossification so i and you, we recommend that if you take indomethacin you take on day 1 most of these patients have not eaten for long time because they are part of the polytrauma and you give them one indomethacin they get severe stomach pain so most of my patients start indomethacin only after they eat well normally by 8 to 10 days time so they don't get the first dose on the first day if these patients have some contraindication not to take indomethacin i give them 700 cgy of radiation that's what i do but out of uh, whatever number i have done i have only once given radiation but rest of the patients are on indomethacin we start them around 10 to 12 days time on an average so if you give a larger exposure larger the powerful retractors do not cause much muscle necrosis so i think that's why you don't get hcho washing the wound with hydrogen peroxide and water probably helps we debride the necrotic tissue around the gluteus minimus which is taking origin from the capsule i think that is how we think that the incidence of heterotopic ossification being very low in our country lateral cutaneous nerve injury professor mata has already mentioned if you keep your incision lateral you can avoid this injury so in my opinion complications are avoidable to a great extent and reduction of complex fracture is superior with this approach because the outcome of surgery is also influenced by the complexity of the fracture treated the anterior approaches or the kl approach being used for less complex fractures should not be compared with extended iliofemoral approach which deals with a serious subset of complex fractures where you are expected to see more complications it is probably not right to compare this approach with other approaches since as dr mayo said anatomical reduction of acetabular fracture is paramount this approach seems better than other approaches in achieving this goal and this approach should not be discredited for whatever complications that we see the risk in this approach is the heterotopic ossification i don't see whatever other risk we explain are big enough for us to stop doing this approach most risk can be avoided by taking precautions and we need a bigger study on this approach rewards reduction is far superior it allows intraarticular direct reduction it forgives intraop mal reduction by allowing you easy revision and it's an excellent approach for most complex acetabular fractures my ideal patient would be somebody between the age of 20 to 50 complex fractures as explained by all the speakers maybe the low abc fracture is probably most ideal for this kind of approach and late presentations i think it's not is comparing extended iliofemoral approach to other approach is like comparing an apple with an orange thank you all for your patience over to you mehlo dr das thank you very much um so that was a, an excellent talk on the risks and the and the rewards and certainly from what you've shown us the rewards um certainly seem to balance or out, outweigh the uh, the risks from from the results you've shown um as a as a result of shortage of time what we'll probably do is take some questions after dr sen's talk if that's all right so we'll do dr sen's talk now and then take some questions for both you and dr sen afterwards um so it's my privilege to um uh asked dr sen who's a very good friend a colleague a mentor and one of one of the uh, most prolific pelvic anastabular surgeons uh, 
um, in India to give the next talk. Um, he's published um, lots and lots on pelvic and acetabular fractures, as well as um, other traumatic and non-traumatic non conditions. So it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Sen. Thank you, Mehul. It is so nice to have good words around you. And I just go back to uh, this slide to show uh, Joel when I was with him about 20 years back in San Diego and one of these CICOT meetings. I met him that time and this is the photo of that time. On the right side, I met uh, this December only, Michael Rusky over there for the EO course. And down there I have been meeting Professor Keith Mio, number of times because last five, six years as a part of a pelvic expert group member, and then in the courses all across the world, wherever I find him there, we are usually there in the EO courses also. So I wish to thank from my side also for the very renowned faculty to be here for our Indian webinar as such. Now, when we start looking at the literature, my job is briefly to look at the literature, what has happened. This is from the first edition of the fact of the Estolum book by Leternal and Judith. And you can see these dignitaries down there over in the photograph also. And there the started the explanation of this Elif Murl approach. So C.P. Das, with his passion for this approach, has already talked about a bit of the literature also and the way he deals with it. These are the photograph from the first, but there is a very interesting point. If you look in that book in the first edition, if you look at the table where the number of surgeries done has been written at extended elius moral, this is empty. And the explanation is that that time the follow-up had not been available at that stage. In the second edition, however, it was mentioned out that there were 114 surgeries by extended elius moral approach. 48 of them developed heterotopic ossification also, but there were other Bit, bit of complication and they're very minimal if you look at the necrosis, hematoma, intraarticular, nerve injuries, one case, one case, two case, nothing but heterotopic ossification as um, uh, Joel said it or it may said it is an important mention in whole of the literature. And we had been reading, reading all this literature about this approach, whatever knowledge and whatever limited cases we did with the knowledge of these books. I was looking for Orensky's publication and I found way back in 1986, probably he has published in an Italian, which I could not get into. And there was another paper in 1993, which again did not mention much about the iliofemoral approach, extended iliofemoral approach. But then in 93 itself, there was another paper from England where this has been uh, there in uh, this kind of a situation that uh, if you look at uh, seven cases out of 24 patients were of extended relief model and they as has been right now discussed so the percentage was 35 percent of extended relief model approach then we go further the Mayo's paper in 1994 now this is a series of 163 cases and the percentage for extended relief mode was 15%. In that approach, it was detailed out the amount of time taken, the amount of blood loss, and the kind of the results over there. And if you look at it, the little traditional involvement in nine cases was much less what was in alien venal approach. And as far as this uh, heterotopic ossification, it was significantly more, it was 35% in that series also. Then another paper in 94, particularly from the Joel group, was about the delayed reconstructions. And in this reconstruction, the percentage was 30% of extensile iliofemoral approach, which was more than what is done in acute cases was being discussed in the earlier also in this webinar. And when you look at all those cases, these are the cases if more than three months, which has not been operated earlier, so the, while in the primary, the percentage of extensile relief model approach was 5%, with the late cases or with the reoperation cases, it was 23%. So there definitely is a need in a delayed cases has been well established way back in 1994. 
and further there is very interesting uh, paper which came up they tried comparing and they tried shifting to tri radiate approach if you look at their earlier lateral series it was primarily done for t shape for transverse posterior wall and for both column fractures in the study by alonso they have shifted mostly to tradiated approach and especially in both column also they divided equally between extended elliot moral and tri radiate approach functional results were not very different and accordingly the conclusion they made they made while they had about 40% in tri radiate 25% both approaches provide good visualization of these complex estabolic fractures then in 98 there was a meeting presentation on by extensile henry approach which is similarly giving a kind of an extensile but it was little different and uh, they said that hto incidence with the radiation was reduced in it but this henry approach has been used more often for the tumors also but in the same textbook when they are talking about henry approach they are saying one option could be same extensile iliofemoral approach but they feel the disadvantage of a poor exposure of entire posterior column and ischium as well as the dissection of soft tissue injuries they are not very comfortable but it is helpful whenever the two columns are involved now question comes to as what sipidas has said earlier superior gluteal whether it is really involved or not mark really including joel they had put up this paper where they had 41 treated with extended elliot moral approach and no instance of superior gluteal artery laceration that's very important wordy sipidas just mentioned about one case but it's not as common as we are expecting with the kind of a dissection we make that it could be there so we can be comfortable on that ground in this kind of a situation and then if you look at this paper of 2000 looking at the second complication that is the hto heterotopic ossification whenever you look for all these papers it has been well reported down there if you look at hto incidence 5.2% 31% and in extended elliot more 66% so the incidence in various studies have stayed in all these papers in this area now this is one german paper this was in 2000 they started doing the maryland Uh, modification as he also talked about this modification he doesn't like it but when this uh, modification was done they say the same kind of a thing that though they are able to achieve a better reduction but soft tissue morbidity could be an issue the similar paper had come in 2002 also from adam g star and they have also said that extensile exposures are safely carried out with a limited morbidity as long as appropriate steps are taken to limit predictable complications that's very important then another paper came with the same perception with that modification of the extended relief moral approach and again the conclusion is technically similar high rate of approach related morbidity to be considered carefully and that is probably the reason why it has got a less uh, acceptance this is another paper this was in 2004 where this is said that it provides a good visualization it's good for combined restoration fracture and learning curve is for combined fracture is shorter than for single approaches and it should be the in the armamentorium of a surgeon dealing with all these fractures maybe once you are dealing with the uh, delayed cases you must be knowing it out and as cp das mentioned about this publication of joel that it is and this is practically one of the uh, big experience given that it involved 60 64 cases 60% in both column areas as such with a reasonable amount of follow we further go into this thing now the indications are defined in this paper transtectal transverse or t shape with or without involvement of the posterior wall t shape with wide displacement of vertical fracture or dislocation of symphysis pubis both column with extension to sacroiliac joint combination of the posterior column and all these associated injury pattern and especially if they are delay in their experience they eventually concluded that this can be co- performed comfortably in selected complex estabulum fracture with an acceptable clinical outcome and rate of complication so and the main thing is effective prophylaxis against heterotopic ossification sorry 
so this is the another paper in 2005 they worked out that with the time in their 3670 cases meta analysis only 17% patients had extensile or combined approaches in this situation the uh, there is a very good paper on purely focusing upon acetabulum both column fractures and this is very important in the sense that it has actually given concentration to one particular fracture type where we are talking about this approach and he concludes that most convenient approach for this fractionation of this fracture is extended ilio femoral but again he warns unfortunately the high rate of associated complications leads us to discourage though this is very very important and we review it in the german pelvic multicentry study group studies also we have three periods 90 to 93 98 to 2000 and 2005 to 2006 and if you see the gradually in this chart the cases are gradually decreasing 6% 4% 2% 3% 2% 1% with the registries as we are progressing in this situation and in 2001 another evaluation was done in which they evaluated this approach and it has just come out out of the 257 patients just one patient was put on iliofemoral approach then there is a case report in which which is a kind of a t shaped fracture with the anterior hip subluxation they did it and they found that they could not get a good outcome and the patient landed with arthroplasty and they blamed it on the substantial muscle exposure of the lateral aspect of the acetabulum and circumferential capsulotomy related to the use of this approach that might have caused it and they said to prevent it you need to maintain the limb in abduction and flexion after extended iliofemoral approach blaming it to that kind of a situation but then there is an interesting paper in 2015 again by the same group who had divided their experience into two groups from 1988 to 2002 and 2003 to 2013 and what they say if you look at this chart over here there the combined cases are also decreasing as well extended elif formal approach is also from 9.9 to 1.3% with the time from this period to this period what is interesting is that if you look on this side of it as far as the anatomical reduction is concerned with the time they are better with the anatomical reduction whether it is in a single approach or it is with extensile iliofemoral approach the reductions have become better and likewise the but the complication rate they say from the first series the complication rate has become higher with the time with this approach as such and now to say this is one of the another paper which uh, looks at heterotopic ossification the factors which are responsible and three factors which has given responsible is associated head injury and this approach and no proflex of indomethacin in this their meta analysis when they are talking about heterotopic ossification and then there are another studies and these two are incidental from india where there is one case and one case of this very approach and now i come to one of the last papers by joel which we just saw uh, in 2019 which is one of the outcome of bigger outcome a bigger view it looked at the outcome in relation to element the type of fracture uh, whether associated or not the amount of displacement the amount of delay the amount of previous surgeries and the age incidentally they all factors have been defined as a prognostic indicators for the clinical outcome and they have been found that it can give a 80% good outcome 50% of the joint that fail will do so within first two years and anatomic reduction is most influential but in all this view in this paper nothing has been talked about the approach specificity and approach as a uh, factor in the outcome so this is one of the last paper then this has not concluded about the approach but still going with the standard text it is still a very well described approach where we take a tiles book whether we take the today's ao book it is very well described book whether we take another book by smith and uh, johnson or we take gensler incidentally in this book uh, which is by gensler we see very interesting thing while he describes beautifully this uh, approach but if you come to uh, this summary of approach approach selection 
here you do not find any place for extensile iliofemoral approach in this setup. So though this is described, but when they describe the algorithms for various plates, depending upon the fracture site, they only go for uh, this thing with this mentioned Cocker, Langenbach, extended iliofemoral. Otherwise, it is not mentioned overall in any other approach. So this is what we have to say that we have to now define with this webinar, actually Dr. C.P. Das was too keen to have this thing defined. And if Dr. Keith remembers, we were, I was there in um, AO pelvic course also. Then in the evening, I was asking about how many people it was on the C.P. Das uh, request also that what is the status of this e extensile iliofemoral approach, at least the masters around here can eventually conclude. And as we understand it out, that there will be some role in some selected cases. What are those cases? And again, looking at our Indian perspective, where we are likely to get a reasonable number of delayed cases also, probably we can much define it out, the role of this approach in our Indian context. Thank you. Dr. Sen, thank you very much for um, summarizing the literature and actually highlighting some of the important aspects in the outcomes um, uh, alluded to in all of these articles. So thank you very much. Um, I am just going to share um, some results of uh, a poll that was taken to the, um, the, the, the people who are attending um, the webinar. And then I shall ask um, our international faculty, Dr. Marta, um, Dr. Mayo, uh, and Dr. Aransky for their final um, views and comments on the extended iliofemoral approach um, and its use going forward. So just before we do that, I'll share some, some results of a poll. And so what I did is I, I sent out a poll um, to the group uh, and they responded and there were three questions which I asked in the poll. So the first question was, have you used the extended iliofemoral approach before? And you can see um, that uh, almost 60% said no, and 40% said yes, they had. And this is uh, from a total of 59 responses. If we look at the next question, so I asked the question, have you thought about using the extended iliofemoral approach for a particular case? And again, 59 people responded. And if we look at the results now, 78, so almost 80% of people had thought about using this approach for a case. And then the final question I asked um, was, would you consider using the extended iliofemoral approach in your practice if there was a more targeted training and mentoring program? So again, 59 uh, uh, responses. Um, 73% said yes, 25% said maybe, um, so they were on the fence and could be swayed, um, and uh, a small proportion said no. So I will stop sharing. Actually, I'll do... Go on to that slide. And I shall ask um, uh, our international faculty, firstly, I'll take the opportunity to thank everyone for taking out their time. I know um, there are different time zones involved and it's difficult to get everyone together, but we thank you, um, Dr. Marta uh, and Dr. Mayo, um, who started very early this morning. We thank you, Dr. Aransky, um, who for you, it was just after lunchtime. Um, and we thank our faculty from India as well, who joined us late afternoon, early evening. So thank you very much for all your participation. But before we finish, what I would like is, is some final concluding remarks on the extended iliofemoral approach going forwards um, and taking it forward for certain acetabular fracture cases. Um, I'll ask Dr. Marta first. Um, I'll just make, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I wasn't sure I was on muted. Uh, I was going to make a couple comments. One about using the orthopedic table. I think the orthopedic table is most useful for avoiding uh, 
the extended iliofemoral approach. So what it can do is maximize your exposure through Cochrane-Langenbeck uh, prone or ilioinguinal supine. But you saw a number of cases without the orthopedic table on extended iliofemoral, and, and it actually may be the most applicable approach uh, without the orthopedic table that you don't lose so much when you have it. There was quite a bit of discussion about possible injury to the superior gluteal artery or superior gluteal vein. What I actually worry more about in acetabular fracture surgery is the superior gluteal nerve. And so injury to vessels typically don't have the long-term complication, but if you lose the superior gluteal nerve, this can definitely cause the abductor weakness. So uh, keep in mind, regardless of the approach, let's say Coker Langenbeck or extended, if you get bleeding from the superior gluteal artery, the first step is to pack the area and try to do it just by packing with sponges because the nerve is anatomically anterior to the artery. And if your first step is to take a hemostat, a clamp, and try to clamp the bleed or the artery, you're likely to clamp the nerve, which is going to be more damaging than the, uh, the arterial injury. So anyway, as we've all recognized, and I've recognized, there's been a trend to less use of the extended approach, and that happened over 30 years of me doing acetabular fractures. But this was partly a change in the population of acetabular fractures. I think we had an aging of patients, maybe less severe motor vehicle trauma. But India may be a different application where you still have some uh, severe injuries. For instance, pedestrians by motor vehicles can bring about uh, patterns that the extended iliofemoral is relevant, and also the delayed treatment of fractures, which probably in my hands was more common initially, now has disappeared. Uh, it has gone down in incidence, but in India, you, it, it seems that you still have a number of these delayed cases where this approach is applicable, but it is as Keith Mayo discussed and everybody discussed, it's probably the most demanding approach. Uh, Dr. Das, I think you made some really good points about soft tissue handling. We all talked about soft tissue handling and just uh, uh, proper making the approach, proper repair. And then during surgery, being ex extremely gentle with this large gluteal flap and uh, keeping it moist. So soft tissue handling, knowledge of anatomy, doing the approach properly is very important. And you definitely need specific training for this approach. Dr. Mayo, your thoughts and remarks. Well, I would just say that <clears throat> actually the numbers from your poll is uh, actually, I think if you repeat that poll in North America, the numbers that have either done or considered an extended iliofemoral would sadly be much lower. Um, and so the question is, why is that? And I think it really is a, a, a training deficiency and, and that uh, things that you, it becomes a vicious circle. So if you've never seen one, you won't do one. Or if you do one infrequently, then you don't want to do one and pretty soon any skill that you had or familiarity and comfort level with that disappears. And so then you can come up with any number of rationales that will allow you to push the alternatives uh, to points in which um, no, no one would have considered 20 years ago. And so, I mean, to me, there's a certain irreducible set of injuries which cannot be optimally managed in a young patient from any other approach. And the key ones of those are the ones that involve the inaccessible inferior portion of the sacroiliac joint with some component of the posterior column. Now, having said that, the only alternative for that is the, the approach that Jeff Mast described, which was the extended ilioinguinal, which took the lateral aspect of the ilium posterior to the medius pillar uh, 
to allow access to the external aspect of the innominate bone and then the anterior portion of the ilioinguinal from there over. That's a logistically complicated approach because of the positioning. That's the only real alternative. And so every time that you take one of these problematic patterns and come up with a different solution to it other than an extended iliofemoral, the chance of uh, ending up with a malreduction is exceedingly high. Now the question is how well will that malreduction be tolerated? And CP has already shown a number of cases in which the reduction of, of a congruent dome with the femoral head as a number of studies have shown in the past has been shown to be uh, give acceptable short and intermediate term results. And the real question is, you know, when is that acceptable? And I don't really have a good answer for that. I certainly think it, that it worked in many cases, but the long-term results from Emil's series and from Joel's series show a divergence between sec secondary congruence uh, in the first and second de decade. So um, in the young patient with a complicated pattern, I think absolutely the goal should still be an anatomic reduction. And in those patterns we've discussed, I think clearly the external the extended ileofemoral is the approach that gives us the best chance of doing that. And even more so in cases where you're dealing with a high percentage of late cases, because I don't think there's a good alternative in late cases. Keith, thank you very much. Um, I'll ask Michelle for his uh, comments. Michelle, you're on mute. Michelle, you're still on mute. It's okay now? Yes, yep. that's good. Okay. The surgeon population in Italy has certainly changed. I can tell you there are at least three hospitals that do, do that treat more than 100 pelvic and acetabular fractures a year, but they do no extended iliofemoral approach. So they demonize this approach. Uh, and I ask, I was asking to myself now, what they do in cases where there is the SA joint involvement or similar situation where you cannot, uh, okay, uh, okay, simultaneous or successive approaches, but the surgeon, they, they don't want to do anymore. That's what happened in Italy. Uh, and probably on the courses, it's not very well explained. Uh, the, another comment, okay, this is a general comment. The another comment about the gluteal artery hemorrhage, Carlos Sancineto told to me to use the, the catheter, the, how you, how you, the, well, the, the urinary catheter, the balloon. You inflate that, you, you put the sponges, but you inflate, inflate the catheter, and it, it, this is very effective to stop the bleeding. Um, we had a late case where I injured the, the artery and we say that Carlos was there and we say that the patient in this way. So that's the other. Great. Uh, well, thank you. I have seen, okay, and I see a lot of patients also, for example, treat with a T fracture treated by the stopper. Everybody wants to do the stop approach, the stop approach. But if you have a both column fracture, the movement of the fracture and the dislocation, it cannot be managed by the stop approach because you cannot, you, you cannot use the second window. You cannot push over the wing or the posterior column. So I don't know, it's a different way of thinking. Michelle, thank you. I'll take this opportunity to ask um, Carlos for his uh, comments as well, Carlos. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, a superb meeting. I, I think that I'm not going to say anything much more important than the previous speakers, but for sure, th there are cases that they can be done everywhere for every single surgeon. And those cases were really complex, like the cases you have been presenting. They should be 
preserved for expert surgeons. And I don't know how it's everywhere in India if the average surgeon has the ability to resolve complex cases, but I think that it creates the necessity, at least in country like Argentina or maybe in India, that means developing country, to have referral centers where this knowledge should be preserved, this approach and the complex approaches for complex cases in order to avoid to go straightforward from the, the complex case to the total hip replacement. I think that in the hands of the experienced surgeon, the knowledge should be preserved and we need to transmit this knowledge to the younger generation. I think this is the must for the people of our age. Carlos, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comment. So I'll hand over to um, uh, Dr. Shah, Dr. Pranav Shah to uh, make the last um, uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much. So I take this opportunity to thank all of you who have taken your precious time out for all of us in India. Our Association of Pelvic Acetabular Surgeons in India will, is very grateful to all of you. Uh, we look forward to more association with uh, Dr. Mata, Dr. Mayo, Dr. Michelle, and Dr. Carlos in future. And uh, uh, I think uh, in leadership uh, with Dr. Ramesh Sen and Dr. C.P. Das, we all are going to embark on this journey of EIFA, and we will be sharing our experiences with you soon. Thank you very much. And have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you. Dr.